y'all. This is Ishtay Keter Fox. Welcome to my stream. Um, just as a note, I'm going to give people time to filter in on this one. Uh, you know, being nice for once. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm usually nice. Um, but yeah. Giving people time to filter in. Any questions before we start that I know of? I I've watched bits and pieces of this because I was thinking of just, you know, playing the good parts and just marking them out. Um, but then I decided, you know what? We're just going to watch the whole thing. Just waiting a bit for people to filter in. And yes, I'm a nerd. So I'll start adding things in. Um, and I did work at a space museum. I'm not just writing that down there to say, but it was a while ago. And... Uh, yeah. Um, almost been a decade. Oh my fucking god! But yeah, we're gonna watch the whole thing, at least. Be nerdy out. Thank you so much for the subscription, Haru! How you doing? Ready to nerd out? Ready to learn some new stuff? Ready to learn how the gaming industry has stuff to do with this? Believe it or not, I, I know about this, so it's going to be interesting. I'll say they, they even have a segment about this. It's one of the things I haven't brought up before, so um, mainly because I usually forget about it and uh, because ADHD, what's that? Oh, yeah. I do have some articles that I've been saving, though, um, that have to do with some new space discoveries they've made. Um, but th it doesn't have to do with the initiative. Uh, by the way, this is... Um, I want to say, this technically, even though it's... Learn. Okay, this is uh, uh, two hours, almost two hours long, so... You can come back and watch the uh, replay later, if worse comes to worse. Or you can nerd out and get her to watch this too. I I'm joking, or am I? Who knows? <laughs> is she back from China? Or is it just going to be one of those hangout on um, call or something? You can go to China. Why am I thinking China? I confused. Sorry if I'm confusing you with other people. It was your cousin. Ah. Uh, sorry, I got it confused. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't. Family relation. Well, at least I'm right, it was a family relation. Sorry. So am I. With my brain injury. <laughs> Sorry. 
give it five minutes in case people want to filter in. So let's go ahead and start. Um, oh, one of the things I wanted to say is this technically is kind of like a, it's a private corporation, by the way, that did this, but it's in, you know, um, partnership with NASA. There are a few other corporations that do have it, like Boeing, um, the others that are escaping me now. And if I remember correctly, Boeing actually has a contract with NASA about a uh, Mars lander. Uh, as in sending people to Mars, but the thing is, they were announcing that back when I worked at the Space Center, so... It obviously hasn't go anywhere for a bit. A lot. Anyways, the start of this is, um... Uh, this is the Artemis Initiative or something like that, so... Because, of course, Artemis is... Goddess of Moon Goddess. And it's been 52 years! Oh, come on. <laughs> no, it is not. Uh, attempting to land on the moon, to return the United States to the moon for the first time in 52 years. Nova C uses an environmentally friendly mixture of liquid methane and liquid oxygen. Incredibly challenging thing like landing on the moon forced us to innovate. Intuitive Machines has built an entire space program to support these CLIPS missions. The company completed its One. lunar lander in a new facility at the Houston Spaceport, just down the street from NASA's Johnson Space Center. It's an autonomous Nova C class lunar lander named Odysseus. But it's lunar an actual lander, lander, lunar lander, lander it's not like a Florida probe or a uh, Since then, teams have been integrating like the that. spacecraft to Falcon 9's second stage in preparation for launch. Go ion 1 and the Odysseus lunar lander. Falcon 9 has successfully lifted off from Pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center. An incredible sight to see. Odysseus lunar lander separation confirmed. Our Nova C lunar lander has successfully separated from the second stage of the launch vehicle, autonomously commissioned, and made first communications contact. I wonder, Nova usually control. I think it took Our a week originally to the moon and back when. No surprise because the physics are very much the same. Let's honor this no, 14 days, I think, two weeks. And prepare when, for the way back when. And triumphs that await us on in Apollo. Journey. Oh, I should probably. Hey, this close cap. I'm keeping the You're close captioning in case people will need it, um, but it's kind of slow right now. Taking a live look into Intuitive Machines' Nova Control in Houston, Sorry Texas, where flight controllers are preparing to start the landing sequence for the IM-1 mission. Our mission and That's activity right. directors are sitting closest to the large monitor inside Nova oh, Control, geez, so and they're supported by 10 additional flight controllers surrounding the Circular Mission Operations Center. Good afternoon and welcome to our coverage of the descent and landing of the IM-1 mission. I'm Josh Marshall, Communications Director of Intuitive Machines. And I'm Gary Jordan with NASA Communications. This mission is one of the first under a task order with NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative. Under Artemis, we're returning to the moon to conduct groundbreaking. Because, by the way, if the reason why it's oh commercial and stuff, um, we don't have the ability at NASA to do these kinds of things anymore. We have to actually, instead of like way back in the past, um, mind you, uh, NASA did you know, collaborate with uh, private companies, um, but they were still technically under the umbrella of NASA. Um, they were considered private contractors. Um, but now it's... Making ...scientific discoveries and technological advancements. And this mission with Intuitive Machines is we helping don't even us have rockets And Gary and I are at Intuitive Machines' facility here in Houston, just down the street uh, from NASA's space Johnson Space Center. Retired. Right now, inside Nova Control, flight controllers are monitoring our Nova C-class lunar lander named Odysseus ahead of its autonomous landing sequence that begins with powered descent initiation at 5.11 p.m. Central Time for a landing time at 5.24 p.m. 
p.m. Central. Right now, they're keeping an eye on the room's situational awareness tool called the Viz, which you can see on your screen now. The Viz is casted onto a large television in the front of Mission Control, so the activity director and the mission director can have the best view, Gary. And the Viz is an animation representing real-time telemetry data feeding into Nova Control. Nova Control receives the data, runs it through Unreal Engine 5, okay. and generates a visualization of the data. It's a useful tool for situational awareness and keeping track of what flight controllers expect Nova C is doing in space. The white line points to the moon. The blue line is the past and intended trajectory. The yellow and red lines are pointing towards the sun and earth, respectively. The different color cones you see at the top are the antenna arrays used for line of sight communication back to earth. We'll show the Viz periodically throughout our coverage up to about 12 minutes prior to landing. In these final moments before landing, the most reliable spacecraft data will be relayed through Nova Control audio loops. And we're starting our coverage later than expected today as flight controllers continue to assess Nova C's trajectory, guidance, navigation, and control. All right, I'm pausing right here. I want you to look in the corner of the screen where I'm not the other corner of the screen, and you notice the patch. Um, each mission has its own patch, official mission, um, and is actually usually um, designed by the astronauts themselves, but since uh, obviously there are no astronauts on this one, it's not. Um, at least at the uh, mu Space Museum I worked at, you could buy patches for nearly all the, um, you know, s uh, missions, um, and usually one of the things that it lists on there is, of course, uh, like, there's usually a Latin phrase somewhere in there. Um, it's kind of one of those things, so just as a general statement on that one. Nova C maintained a low lunar orbit, but is in a slightly more elliptical shape. Last night, flight controllers performed a lunar correction maneuver burn to adjust the lander's orbit. This burn kept Nova C on a trajectory to land in Malapert A, but moved our landing time estimates earlier by about an hour. Then today, flight controllers chose to exercise an additional orbit before starting the IM-1 mission landing sequence. This decision brought us to now, projecting a landing time of 1724 Central Time. Intuitive Machines made the decision to reassign the primary navigation sensors from Odysseus's laser range finding system to use the sensors on NASA's navigation Doppler LiDAR. This is a dynamic situation, and we'll update you later in the broadcast. Intuitive Machines still intends to land on in the optimum lighting window, and the lunar correction maneuver performed last night eliminated the need for the planned 10-second deorbit initiation burn which would have brought Nova C from low lunar orbit into the descent phase. Nova C's current trajectory has it continuing to decrease its altitude over the next hour until the braking burn called powered descent initiation. Again, the landing time is expected at 5.24 p.m. Central Standard Time, 6.24 p.m. Eastern. The countdown clock at the top of your screen is counting down to the time that we expect to remove, and we uh, re expect to remove the countdown clock approximately two minutes before the landing opportunity. Getting to this moment, Gary has been quite the journey and it's lasted about seven days so far since liftoff from launch complex 39a at nasa's kennedy space center okay want to know Odysseus an interesting lifted thing off at 105 a.m eastern standard time from atop a spacex falcon 9 rocket on february 15th approximately 48 minutes later intuitive machines as nova oh, well, c-class oh, lunar lander entered a translunar orbit a direct shot at the moon in the following days after launch, flight controllers in Nova Control commanded engine firings to place the lander into low lunar orbit approximately 100 kilometers or 62 miles above the lunar surface. The journey to low lunar orbit included firing the first liquid methane and liquid oxygen engine in space. This was called the commissioning maneuver. It was a full thrust main stage engine burn with a throttle down profile necessary to land on the moon. Over the last 24 hours, Odysseus has maintained maintained its trajectory in low lunar orbit, waiting for suitable lighting conditions to begin its autonomous descent to Malapert A, the designated landing site for the IM-1 mission near the south pole of the moon. All right, story time. Believe it or not, Alan Shepard, he was one of the, um, let's say, this is it. 
He was one of the um, astronauts that went to the moon. Actually snuck... Um, uh, true story! Uh, well, obviously a true story. Snuck aboard, because he was really liked playing golf. Um, snuck aboard in his spacesuit a golf club and hit the um, golf balls in his socks to be able to do that uh, rec uh, I mean that scene where you see him doing uh, you know teeing off on the moon and it, it, it's kind of hard to um... <laughs> yeah <laughs> kind of hard to do it on the um in the uh, spacesuit, but yeah, he, he snuck it in there. Um, and apparently only one other person knew, um, which was the mission director. Um, and he was required, uh, one of the only requirements of him was to um, only do it if you have enough time um, to do all the other important things that um, you were supposed to be doing. Um, so the whole scene is like nine hours after um, doing scientific experiments. Um, and when he was returning to the module was when he decided it. Now, apparently, I, I'm not a golf person, so I don't know what the exact um, kind of club he used, but he actually talked to somebody to modify it. Um... So, it's just one of those amazing things, if you think about it for a second. Um, there's something else about Alan Shepard that I'm forgetting. Because he was one of the important ones, because I think he did... Um, yeah, he was a... Uh, second person um, to go into space, and he was the first um, uh, American to go into space. Um, this was after. Um, and he's also, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, one of the oldest persons to walk on the moon. I don't remember his age, so randomness. All right. Our joint coverage will follow Odysseus through its descent and landing on the lunar yeah, he surface, was a part of the Mercury carrying 12 too. payloads down with it. Apollo the mission 14. is enabled under a task order with NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services, or CLPS. Here's more on this initiative under Artemis. Our moon. It seems so close in the night sky, but getting there is really hard. But what if there was a way to change that? Only a few nations have successfully landed on the moon. As NASA sends astronauts Two, back to the lunar one, surface, this time to stay, we will need to send science and technology instruments ahead of time to lay the foundation for human exploration. To make this happen, NASA is helping establish you know, the commercial when I was lunar economy. Back when I was actually at the Space uh, uh, Museum, they were saying they were going to do this in a couple of years. It's, it's been... For the first time ever, there will be commercial delivery services to the moon. We are enabling American companies to send our payloads to the lunar surface for us. These delivery services will expand our capabilities for exploration, radically increasing the amount of science we can achieve. This high-risk, high-reward initiative will invest in and leverage the entrepreneurial spirit of American innovation to launch a commercial lunar marketplace, advancing technology and exploration for all of us. With this never-before-seen streamlined access to the moon, we will be able to make novel measurements and develop technologies that scientists have long wanted to do on the lunar surface. And as this new industry matures, this commercial delivery service for NASA and other customers could expand beyond the moon to other destinations in our solar system. And we can learn to live on another world because we are explorers. Clips is an important pathway towards long-term exploration of the moon and part of mm -hmm. NASA's Artemis missions that will establish a sustainable presence in the lunar vicinity and prepare humans for missions to Mars. For more on how this fits in with the greater plan...
Oh, recently they've um, sent out a call for um, people to do a test thing for a year of uh, recreating Mars conditions somewhere uh, and basically um, getting a whole bunch of people to survive for a year together to do this. And uh, recreating also like um, trying to do scientific uh, research on the moon, uh, I mean on Mars and stuff. And uh, they're right now, if anybody's interested, uh, you have to have like a whole bunch of degrees for it, of course, but Plan. Let's head over to NASA's Leah Cheshire, who's just down the hall. Hey, Leah. Thanks, Gary. I'm here with Joel Kearns, NASA's Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration. Thanks so much for being here, Joel. Oh, thank you, Leah. It's great to be here on landing day, which is the culmination of about five years of work by Intuitive Machines Corporation. Yeah, we're really excited, and we want to know a little bit more about NASA's goals mm -hmm. for the CLIPS initiative. Okay. So, uh, you know, most basically what we want to do is we want to have American companies take NASA equipment and scientific investigations all the way to the surface of the moon and not have to have NASA do that ourselves. Mm. You know, NASA is really good at doing robotic space science. Yeah, just chatting. Ew. Disgusting. Hi, Rocket. Also, um, an interesting fact uh, is a lot of the technology we use now is actually was given to uh, private companies um, for free since they were developed by the government. Um, so the fact that we're right now, NASA's pretty much hands off when it comes to that outside of, you know, they've now become the private contractors that they used to hire. Science missions, whether that's the James Webb Space Telescope or it's the Mars rovers. But what we knew about five or six. You saying because of ads? Yeah, ew, just talking. Nerds. Yeah, no, what I was saying was um, NASA basically has become the private contractors of um, commercial businesses. Well, it used to be the opposite. So, woo. Five or six years ago that we would start going to the moon to do science and exploration investigations. We knew we'd be going back every year, so we turned to industry to see if they could actually take us to the moon instead of us having to do, us, do it ourselves. And that's how we came up with commercial lunar payload services. There's th the other reason why is they kept on like pushing back. They'd say, oh, we're going to go in a few years. And uh, like when I was saying about when I worked at the Space Museum, what they would say was, oh, we're going to do this in two years and stuff. But then NASA's budget would be cut in that in that field. And so um, they'd go, oh, we, we have to push it back more um, because uh, we have to pay for you know, the endless war. Um, and it just kept on being pushed back, pushed back. There's three objectives for commercial lunar payload services or CLIPS. One is that we want to do great science on the moon. The second is we want to test out technology and engineering for future human exploration in Artemis. And the third is we want to generate a group of companies that are highly skilled in doing these robotic lunar landings so that we can be used, we can use them as part of our Artemis initiative. Well, let's talk about that a little bit more. How is CLIPS beneficial to the Artemis campaign? Well, a number of different ways. For example, we will do science at the South Pole with our astronauts and Artemis and also with robotic explorers. They'll be brought down on CLIPS. But we're also going to use these robotic landings, these commercial robotic landings, to do science at places where we won't initially send astronauts. Another, we can use them, for example, this intuitive machine mission that's going on today that'll land in the South Pole region will be one of the first forays into the South Pole to actually look at the environmental conditions to a place we're gonna be sending our astronauts in the future. That is, what type of dust or dirt is there? How hot or cold does it get? What's the radiation environment? These are all things you'd really like to know before you send the first human explorers. I'd also say that in the future, when we are flying humans to the moon as part of Artemis, we can use commercial services like CLIPS to pre-stage equipment or other cargo so that they're waiting for the astronaut explorers when they land. And this is an entirely new approach that uses a privately developed lunar lander. What are some of the, so what are some of the most important takeaways on risks but also benefits of a model like this? So when industry came to NASA about six years ago and said we could do this for you as a service, what they said was they thought it would be less expensive than if we did it ourselves. 
that they could do it faster than we could set up to do it, and that they could do it more frequently, that they could do more than one mission you know, every year or two. And so far we've seen is that looks like that's gonna be true. What we're waiting to see, such as with the mission today, is can they actually do this incredibly difficult thing? Can they really land on the surface of the moon robotically? This is something which is extremely challenging and difficult to do. Um, the moon has no air. You can't use parachutes or wings to slow down. You have to, in effect, ride a rocket engine all the way from orbital speed, you know, thousands of miles per hour, all the way down to a very soft touchdown speed to land in this place, which is very rough, pretty rugged, in really unusual lighting and communication conditions. So this is not an easy thing we have asked these um, companies to do, but if they're successful, the upside for American exploration is just so great, we have to try it. Yeah, absolutely. Those are important distinctions. And thank you so much for joining us here today, Joel. With that, we're going to toss it back to Josh and Gary to preview the landing sequence. Yeah. Thanks, Leah. We're following sorry, along I'm with Novacy's descent toward the I've lunar... been pausing too much. I'm sorry. It's just so much information I have. Surface. The lander is continuing to decrease its altitude until the power descent initiation, an 11 minute braking burn that sets Nova C up for the final moments prior to touchdown. That time of ignition for PDI or power descent initiation is 5 11 p.m. Central Time, 6 11 p.m. Eastern. The entire landing sequence is autonomous, meaning the lander is in control of every milestone required for a lunar landing opportunity, Gary. And complete. I mean, they, I, I, I've heard this rumor that uh, females can have continuous ones, but I mean, who knows on that one? Completing a soft touchdown comes with challenges unique to, say, landing on the Earth or Mars, because there's no atmosphere. Gary, it's an entirely different playbook as we've seen this dynamic situation play out today. Let's take a look at the IM-1 mission's complete trajectory approach as of launch. Okay, I have a nerd story. Y'all ready for this? It, it kind of has to do because it was with Apollo 1, but not completely. But I... I it's a sad ending, but I mean, it's an amazing story. Okay, um, Gus Grissom, um, he was in the only real astronaut to be in all three, if I remember correctly. Um, but uh, he was, um, okay, he was first a part of the Mercury program, which was just a one-man flight up into the um, uh, suborbit. And then, you know, splashing back down and all this other stuff. He originally um, wanted to name, because it's, it's like a bell shape to some degree. Um, there is one at the Space and Rocket Center. Um, but, and I think the one at the Space and Rocket Center was more or less uh, one that wasn't used. Because it normally is supposed to, you know, um, land in the ocean. Because uh, the, uh, trying to get it to land on ground was one of the harder ones, I'll say. It's, it's just, the impact was really bad. I mean, it's only recently that they uh, were able to start actually doing it on the ground. Um, it also, um, trying to get it to slow down enough, uh, you take up more space than, because uh, space was an issue, especially with weight, um, to trying to get it to slow down and land on, you know, the ground. Um, so just having it splash down in the ocean is far easier and... Um, but the bell shape, he originally wanted to call it the um, Unsinkable Molly Brown as a joke. And um, Molly Brown, because there was a musical at the time that was based after Molly Brown, which was a, um Irish entrepreneur lady, to some degree, that became rich on her own. And basically was on the Titanic and a whole bunch of other ships that just happen to end up sinking and her surviving or was it just the titanic i think she was on another one like two different ships um and she of course on the titanic led pretty much led operations to save people so she was famous for that to do um but of course this other scientists were like sitting there going y you can't name it that so he named it the Liberty Bell and even painted 
annoyingly annoying the scientists a crack in the side of it which for all you non-americans um the liberty bell has a crack in it. it it's based after a big liberty bell um i don't remember where it is um it, it's a historical thing um well the liberty bell sunk um because there was a pin that um went off when he landed in the um, ocean. Um, and so it flooded and sunk, which isn't supposed to happen. Uh, but the, the joke with Z painted the crack on the side. He had a really interesting sense of humor, okay? Um, <laughs> all right, For then he was in Project Gemini, and the reason why, yeah, I know, take care of their bell better. yeah. Then he was in Project Gemini, and the reason why it's called Gemini is the fact that it has its two pilots in there. Well, um... One of the things is with the Gemini also landing in the ocean, um, he... He ate, um, I think it was a, some kind of beef sandwich, I don't remember. Um, he shared it with his co-pilot, um, uh, before this, uh, you know, because it's not going to be up there that long. Um, was like, I think it was like four hours, give or take. Um, take care of the, um, but while they were floating in the ocean waiting to be picked up um it just kind of got sick to his stomach and threw up um hardy har 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 now the sad one because every single one he was kind of a part of he something kind of went wrong on it um, but he was a part of the Apollo 1. Uh, but they died. That's the reason why you don't really hear about it, is there was a simulator um, that they were doing with simulated inside there with pure oxygen. And the problem with pure oxygen is it's very flammable. The one tiny spark can cause everything to go and even though gus and some of the others were like sitting there going this doesn't feel safe they were doing uh, simulated pre-flight checks and there was a spark and they went um basically the last thing that's heard over the intercom, I mean the, uh, yeah, over the recorded radio is somebody, which they think was Gus, screaming fire. Um, not only that, is they use flammable material, I mean, you, you gotta think about this, these are scientists here, they also use other flammable materials within the cockpit. And, and inwardly opening hatch so you know the reason why doors are supposed to be especially for outdoor uh, the outer doors are supposed to be able to pull forward rather than inward um because during fires sometimes the pressure within a um room makes it hard to open doors and to have it go outwards Uh, basically, you can push your body against it and, th you know, throw yourself out. So. Anyways. Uh, this the is Intuitive side Machine's story. IM-1 mission is sending commercial and NASA payloads to the Lunar South Pole region on an uncrewed robotic Nova C-class lunar lander called Odysseus. The lander is the tip of the iceberg. And what's below that is the full program that is on a miniature scale, very similar to what the Apollo program had. 
The IM-1 flight path mirrors the historical achievements of Apollo 2, starting with separation for the launch vehicle on a direct shot at the moon. That trajectory is basically like throwing a fastball that is going to hit the moon six or seven days later, like an outfielder stretching out to ground. Yeah, that's definitely the first faster. The days are dedicated to flight controllers in Houston then firing the lander's 3D printed liquid methane and liquid oxygen engine to make small course adjustments to hit its orbit target around the moon. This particular coordinate system is called the B-plane. You can think about the B-plane kind of like the backboard of a basketball game. And you basically know when you shoot hoops, that if you can get the basketball in the square on that backboard, it's gonna go in. And the B-plane for astrodynamicists is very much the same thing. With the B-plane on target, Odysseus is prepped for a critical autonomous maneuver on the moon's far side. This critical burn maneuver is completed in the blind with the moon blocking direct communications back to Nova Control in Houston. Once we get around the moon, we have on the day side of the moon, the sun heating us from one side and reflected infrared light off the bright moon warming us on the other. Then we plunge into night and now we're cold on both sides. It's very tough. About an hour before landing, flight controllers command descent orbit insertion or DOI. This is a main engine firing to slow the spacecraft so its altitude drops from 100 kilometers to about 10 kilometers above the lunar surface. After DOI, Odysseus coasts for about an hour before starting its final approach. And then we reach a point called power descent initiation. The guidance system on board makes the decision to activate the main engine at very close to full power. Cameras and lasers are feeding information to the lander's navigation algorithms, which provide guidance, navigation, and control. With a safe site identified, Odysseus enters a three meter per second descent, then down to one meter per second for the last 10 meters to the lunar surface. Now, the lander is using an inertial measurement unit, which is similar to a human inner ear that senses rotation and acceleration. Flight controllers expect about a 15 second delay before confirming the ultimate milestone, softly landing on the surface of the moon. And I can tell you just from doing our simulations, that's the longest 15 seconds you'll ever experience as you wait for the final light to turn green to indicate that you've landed on the moon. Approximately 12 minutes before our landing opportunity, we are going to show this animation of the landing sequence to describe the lander's autonomous operations, starting with power oh. descent initiation, or PDI. During this maneuver, Odysseus must reduce its velocity by approximately 1,800 meters per second. You can think of it as a braking phase. Then, the lander pitches upright using its main engine with the hazard relative navigation, or HRN, now being fed by NASA's NDL sensors, facing toward the area where the lander intends to touch down. At this point, HRN will autonomously scan the intended landing site for a safe landing area. Then, the lander's guidance, navigation, and control system commands Odysseus to a point approximately 30 meters above the designated landing site, and the lander goes into a vertical descent followed by terminal descent. Intuitive Machines created Nova C for the CLIPS initiative and commercial enterprise with the goal of creating a lunar economy. And Nova C is Intuitive Machines' first autonomous spacecraft. Nova stands for new, and C is the Roman numeral, numeral for 100, the lander's approximate payload capacity. With that, let's learn okay, so that more about the Nova C class lunar lander. This IM-1 mission lander is named Odysseus. The name okay, so Nova 1, uh, let me find real quick. Oh, okay, I'm at two minutes and... Nine seconds, okay. Uh, yeah, give it a second. Uh, for the thing. I'll give it a break! Well, it says in however many minutes. So, uh, I mean, uh, seconds. So, real quickly. Okay, this answers why, um, the top thing is, it's IM is the, uh, name of the company. Which is Intuitive Machines. And that's the first mission. And then the Nova C is what they just explained, and that's the patch. Like I said, they design a patch for every um, uh, mission. I think more recently they started like uh, crowd uh, getting uh, students and stuff to, you know, design the patches. But like I said, the first ones were designed by the pilot 
pilots themselves to some degree. Um, let me jump back to... remember which one of the uh, ones in the more recent ones that well the thing is I remember I think for one of the Mars ones because I remember in school them asking students to design it um space bad breaks happening right now um by the way the um let me show you some of the ones that the patches that they did while we're waiting or, um, information to the lander. Just to show you, like I said, it was designed by the, um, the original ones were designed by the, um, mission themselves. And you can see, very basic. Yeah, very, very basic for the original Mercury program, and it got more advanced after that. Um, I find it funny that he added the crack to that as well. Anyways. There's navigation algorithms, which provide guidance, navigation, and control. With a safe site identified, Odysseus enters a three meter per second descent, then down to one meter per second for the last 10 meters to the lunar surface. Now, the lander is using an inertial measurement unit, which is similar to a human inner ear that senses rotation and acceleration. Flight controllers expect about a 15 second delay before confirming the ultimate milestone, softly landing on the surface of the moon. And I can tell you just from doing our simulations, that's the longest 15 seconds you'll ever experience as you wait for the final light to turn green to indicate that you've landed on the moon. Once again, sorry for all the pauses. I just have a lot of stories that I... If it says anything, even with my brain injury, I remember these stories. Approximately 12 minutes before our landing opportunity, we are going to show this animation of the landing sequence to describe the lander's autonomous operations, starting with powered descent initiation, or PDI. During this maneuver, Odysseus must reduce its velocity by approximately 1,800 meters per second. You can think of it as a braking phase. Then, the lander pitches upright using its main engine with the hazard relative navigation, or HRN, now being fed by NASA's NDL sensors, facing toward the area where the lander intends to touch down. At this point, HRN will autonomously scan the intended landing site for a safe landing area. Then, the lander's guidance, navigation, and control system commands Odysseus to a point approximately 30 meters above the designated landing site, and the lander goes into a vertical descent, followed by terminal descent. Intuitive Machines created Nova C for the CLIPS initiative and commercial enterprise with the goal of creating a lunar economy. And Nova C is Intuitive Machines' first autonomous spacecraft. Nova stands for new, and C is the Roman numeral, numeral for 100, the lander's approximate payload capacity. With that, let's learn more about the Nova C class lunar lander. This IM-1 mission lander is named Odysseus. The name was nominated by assembly, integration, and test engineer Mario Romero after the Odyssey and its epic voyage across the daunting, wine-dark sea. Including landing gear, Odysseus is 4.6 meters wide, and with its top deck solar array, it's 4.3 meters in height. It's a taller design that accommodates payloads and the lunar south pole lighting conditions. Its hull diameter is 1.6 meters, with payloads affixed to the entire exterior of the lander, 
year, making its total payload capacity approximately 130 kilograms. The lander weighs 675 kilograms, but packs on weight when loaded with fuel. Odysseus uses composite helium tanks to pressurize its liquid methane and liquid oxygen main engine that can throttle down to perform its final descent to the lunar surface in one continuous burn. Yeah, the even in the older ones, the, the bulk of the weight came from the fuel itself. And believe it or not, at least if I remember with the Apollo missions, most of the fuel was used up within, like, I think, just to get out of the atmosphere and stuff. So, it's one of those things of... <laughs> you use up most of the fuel, the weight, to get out there, and once you're out there, it's, you don't have as much. I think it's mostly used in, like, all the way up to the second phase. Once they hit pre-orbit. Intuitive Machines IM-1 mission is supported by NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative, which allows rapid acquisition of lunar delivery services from American companies. The instruments on board advance capabilities for science, exploration, and the commercial development of the moon. Commercial companies were challenged to come up with their own way to design and fabricate a lunar lander and conduct operations. For this commercial mission, Intuitive Machines elected to support the communications between the spacecraft and Nova Control through its own private ground-based network. And it's not the first time Intuitive Machines used this network in deep space. Well, that's right, Gary. NASA worked with Intuitive Machines to perform technology demonstration of this capability on, the NASA, on NASA's Artemis One mission, which helped us very verify the network for operational use during this CLIPS mission. The Lunar Data Network, or LDN, uses ground-based networks to communicate into deep space, so we could lose signal while Nova C is on the far side of the moon. However, the trajectory of the lander's low lunar orbit does allow for near continuous line of sight with Earth and ground station coverage. Let's head over to NASA's Leah Cheshire to learn more about this network. Leah. What I'm interested in, uh one of the big contracting companies for, uh, like I mentioned Boeing, there's a few others like Honeywell. Um, and I'm kind of surprised, or like SpaceX, I'm kind of surprised why, like SpaceX has especially been providing um, stuff to the International Space Station since we can't do it on our own anymore. Um, since they shut down the shuttle program. Um, and the funny thing is, we were like, oh, we'll just rely on the Russians to, you know, help get people up there and down and all this other stuff. And then let's just say relationships with Russia have kind of been fun. <laughs> so it's kind of been getting harder and harder, of course, to get, um, you know, astronauts up and down there. Because, I mean, like I said, we closed down the... Um, shuttle program um but i also have a secondary story that just popped into my mind since we were talking about alan shepard which like i said is the second um human to orbit the well leave no i don't think he did he orbit i think he did orbit like yeah he did um Jesus, so much information um but because if <laughs> when they decided to you know take off um they were gonna start off like really early in the morning like past um 12 kind of like thing of when they got him up to start uh getting ready for um the mission um and the actual mission itself, like I said, the other one was like four minutes long. So once you actually get up there, it won't be that long. However, um, he literally had to wait being strapped into the castle. I mean, not castle, capsule for, I think, four hours, give or take or more. Um, so they couldn't move him, and so basically he had to use the restroom. Except back then, they didn't give the thought of, what if you're, um... 
What if your astronaut needs to pee? Um, and the delay is kept on getting longer and longer and longer. <laughs> yes. Um, and so basically, he, before it even took off, he eventually had to use the restroom. So he basically peed inside his, um, um, suit. And yes, just simply pee yourself. So uh, the first American to orbit the Earth ended up doing that in his own pee. Now, believe it or not, there are medical sensors that were on the spacesuit that they had to turn, I mean, not spacesuit, the, the suit that they had to turn off because they didn't want him to get electrocuted. Um, but after that, um, of course, they modified the spacesuit so in case that happens again. Um, anyways. Thanks so much, and I am here now with Trent Martin, the Intuitive Machines Senior Vice President of Space Systems. Thanks for joining us, Trent. Thanks. We're here to talk a little bit about the Lunar Data uh, Network. This is a private deep space network, belongs to Intuitive Machines. How does it differ to have Look up this intuitive commercially machines, available real quick. space network, um, and how, how is that different from NASA's deep space network? So when we first got oh, the commercial lunar payload services contract, we were trying to find a way that we could get our data from our landers back to the yeah. Earth. Uh, we were worried that the deep space network, which is often oversubscribed, particularly with James Webb Space Telescope now, uh, that we would, we would have limited time. So what we did was we created a network of large dishes across the planet that allow us to take our data from the moon and deliver it down to the Earth. And we initially tested this out during the Artemis One mission. So how did Intuitive Machines work that out? Yes, yeah, so we worked a re reimbursable space act agreement with NASA to allow us to test our network not only with Artemis at 430,000 kilometers, but also with the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, as well as, as the GOES satellite. Okay, you want to know an interesting fact about that? I repeat, we're, we're only <laughs> 20 minutes into this two-hour, <laughs> almost two-hour thing. It's, I have too many stories. Um, there is so many satellites in Earth's orbit that are defunct now that because they only last a certain amount of time that they actually have to code around making sure new satellites do not hit the old satellites okay now i'm finished okay and what are the goals overall for intuitive machines how do you want to spell how do you want to um, expand this ldn coverage so we believe that as the, as the market expands at lunar distance, many people will need the capability to send data back, particularly if you're operating spacecraft on the, on the back side of the moon, you need to be able to have a relay satellite. So we're gonna put relay satellites in orbit to, to complement our ground-based systems, which are, again, large, large dishes all over the world. And by doing that, we'll be able to hopefully uh, create a market for that data uh, system from lunar s uh, space. Okay. Is there anything else that you want to share that has gone into the development of this network? It, it's really exciting. We've actually been using it this week uh, as we've as once we launched OD into space, Odysseus into <laughs> space, and uh, and we're we're taking it to the moon. We've been using this network um, that we tested with NASA systems uh, for the whole week, and it, it's been incredible uh, to see it work and see it in action. We, uh, we have a long ways to go with it. We need to add additional satellites to the system so that we can, uh, we can relay data back from, from the moon. Um, but we think it is the future of, of humanity at, in, in lunar space. Thanks so much. It's really exciting to see this in action. And uh, we are just minutes away from acquisition of Signal to confirm deorbit insertion. So we're gonna send it back over to Josh and Gary to follow along with the operations. Thanks, Leah. That lunar data network information feeds into Nova Control's communications and ground network console screens. It's just one of many different screens that are used by the flight controllers, and we want to bring you closer into the mission and into our mission operations center. Let's take a look at what flight controller teams are seeing now. 
This particular screen is called the Deorbit Descent and Landing, or DDL screen. This screen is primarily used by the mission director and landing system experts. It's used primarily while Nova C orbits the moon and through landing. I had confusion. The top right images of the moon are called the lunar tactical view. When the dots turn red, the lander is on the far side of the moon, and green is on the near side. The line is the tail where Nova C is, with each dot representing 10 minutes of elapsed time. The acceleration sensed portion of the screen shows raw acceleration values from Nova C's inertial measurement unit. This is used a lot during burn maneuvers and is a more robust way of measuring acceleration over time with the ability to look back at what has happened. For some reason, flight controllers have lost data. Finally, the column on the right is a received, accepted, edited, and failed pre-checked, or RAFE chart for short. When each of these lines are on top of each other, that's a good indication that Nova C's navigation system is in good health. That's because every measurement Nova C makes must be received, accepted, edited, or failed pre-check. The failure is a possible outlier of data that the lander's computer automatically knows is bad information. Collectively, the DDL screen is one of many data displays that flight controllers are monitoring to to successfully navigate Nova C to the lunar surface. Data visualization is an essential component for flight controllers who need to Apps. process this data for real-time decision-making in Nova Control. Now again, we're following along with the flight control teams here in Nova Control prior to the next critical steps, including activation of the navigation Doppler LiDAR to provide guidance, navigation, and control for the landing phase. This is expected around 4.45 p.m. Central Time. The next critical milestone is powered descent initiation at 5 11 p.m. Central. This burn is the first in a sequence of maneuvers that starts about 12 minutes prior to landing, or about 50 minutes from now. Nova C is, of course, landing on the moon as a delivery truck for the scientific instruments and technology demonstrations on board. There are 12 total payloads, six of which are NASA's. Let's review a few of those payloads as we continue to descend towards the lunar surface. First is radio observations of the lunar surface photoelectron sheath, or ROLSES. ROLSES will employ four antennas and a low-frequency radio receiver system to determine the density and scale height of the moon's photoelectron sheath a very thin layer of electrons above the surface of the moon. And we'll also detect solar radio bursts, radio emissions from Jupiter, dust impacting the surface of the moon, and how radio noisy Earth is. An exciting radio telescope is going to be placed on the moon. It is called ROLSYS. It stands for Radio Wave Observations from the Lunar Surface of the Photoelectron Sheath. It's going to detect all kinds of radio emission that is falling on the moon. Right now it is close to solar maximum, so the sun is producing a lot of coronal mass ejections and uh, radio emission associated with them, and we can detect these radio bursts from the sun. Characterization of the radio environment of the moon is very important. It has not been completely done, and therefore ROLSYS will be able to contribute in identifying various uh, sources of radio emission on the sun. If you're setting up an observatory on the moon, we should know what kind of radio interference we get there. The okay. Laser Retro Reflector Array, or LRA, is a collection of eight retro reflectors that enable precision laser ranging, which laser. is a measurement of the distance <laughs> between the orbiting or landing spacecraft to the reflector on the lander. LRA is a passive optical instrument that will function as a permanent location marker on the moon for decades to come. This is a little mirror that's aiming at you all the time, regardless Creepy. which way you're looking at it. My name is Xiaoli Sang. I'm a LiDAR instrument scientist. It's a small retroreflector mounted on aluminum shell on the intuitive machine landers. When you sh shine laser on it, it reflects right back at you. The purpose is to have a precise fiducial marker on the landers. It serves as a landmark for future missions if you want to go back and land it there. But uh, if I remember correctly, they're doing it at the South Pole. So Stereo South cameras Pole. for lunar plume surface studies, or SCALPS, will use a suite of four cameras to capture stereo and still image data of the dust plume created by the lander's engine from when it begins its descent to the lunar surface all the way down through engine shutoff. 
Scalps is an array of small cameras that will be placed around the base of a lunar lander and collect imagery during the descent and landing of the vehicle. Using a technique called stereophotogrammetry, we can use those images mm -hmm. to reconstruct a 3D shape of the ground. As the lander comes down, its hot engine plumes will interact with the surface. Oh, yeah, Our definitely. cameras will begin acquiring images from before this interaction begins until after the vehicle has landed on the surface. That's one of the problems they had with one of the Mars landing things uh, is because they had a problem with the plumes itself. Uh, except for the one that um, the lander that uh, they lost um, in the atmosphere because uh, the landing stuff did not deploy uh, correctly. So, but that's also one of the things, if I remember correctly, one of the scientists that I talked to that was a part of it they had a problem with. Um, in Huntsville, uh, they did uh, testing. Uh, Huntsville, Alabama used to be the testing for the engines and stuff. Uh, and I, I actually went out when I was really young before they, uh, I think I was five or six, before they um, moved it out of the area and stopped doing it there. Um, but I remember uh, the safe location for uh, civilians who wanted to watch it um, because they did it out on the base, and this was back when they... Okay. Bye, Haru! <coughs> Have fun with your sis uh, talking with your sister. Um, and so basically, where they'd had the civilians were, at Redstone Arsenal, before they, of course, 9-11 and all this other stuff, where they stopped allowing civilians onto the base, there was this specific location um, where you could slightly see it, but there were so many... Um, trees around that it helped uh, I would say lessen the impact of the um, engine that was being tested um, but you still had to wear these nice huge <laughs> ear things to protect your ears um, and it was cool to watch uh, but of course when I was young it <laughs> Even at the distance that we were, it literally shook the ground in your body. It, the vibrations were amazing. Um, but one of the things when they were doing the Saturn V testing around Huntsville, and this is a story I heard from a scientist that, were, uh, that was a docent at the Space and Rocket Center, um, is uh, the sound was so loud, um, and they didn't think of this at the time. Um, and it was, an uh, it was an overcast day, so there were clouds. Uh, what I mean by that is there were clouds in the sky. Um, and the vibrations were so bad from doing the test of the engine, it shattered residents' glass, like glass windows, all across the city. And they had to pay to have it replaced. So after that point, because of that, they started... Um, in four different cardinal directions, uh, having people um, watching the skies before they uh, started a actual test to make sure that didn't happen again. Um, which is hilarious to think about if, you, if you're wondering. Um, but one of the other things that just popped in my mind about you have to worry about when it's... Because um, it, the reason why you have to be a certain distance away, of course, is because... The vibrations, even if you're away from the fire and all this other stuff, the vibrations are enough to liquefy your insides. Like, liquefaction, that, that amount of vibrations. It's not just blowing out your eardrum, it is literally liquefying yourself. Um, Alright, sorry. Uh, off on the t I repeat, we're an hour in and we're only 30 minutes into this because I have so many stories of when I worked as a museum guide. So... The scalps cameras will specifically be looking at the overall crater formation and erosion of the ground due to the rocket plumes. The final stereo images, which will be stored on a small onboard data storage unit. Oh, by the way, they didn't have all this technology when they were doing uh, landing on the moon. By the way, it was very hit and miss on that one, and they were they were amazingly enough to actually hit it, uh, get it will be transferred to the lander and then downlinked to Earth, where we can use them to reconstruct the overall erosion volume and shape 
of the ground. With the Artemis program, we plan to establish a sustained lunar exploration and try to land multiple payloads in close proximity to one another. Scalp's data will be a critical part of understanding these phenomena and improving our computational models to inform these future landings. Radio frequency mass gauge, or RFMG, is a fuel gauge used to measure the amount of propellant in spacecraft tanks in a low gravity space environment. Using sensor technology, RFMG will measure the amount or mass of cryogenic propellant in Novice's fuel and oxidizer tanks, providing data that can help predict fuel, fuel usage on future missions. I'm Greg Zimmerly, the principal investigator for the radio frequency mass gauge payload. This instrument is a space age fuel gauge. We're going to use it to measure the amount of cryogenic propellant in the Intuitive Machines Nova Sea Lander propellant tanks. These propellants are very cold. They're at about minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we're integrating the instrument onto an actual lunar lander. Future lunar missions like those in the Artemis program will likely also use cryogenic propellants and have to store those propellants in space for long periods of time. So having an instrument like this that can measure the propellant in the tanks in low gravity will help future lunar missions know how much fuel is in the tank at all times. Okay, interesting fact. Okay, I'm never going to end with the interesting fact part of this. If it says about things that degrade on the moon, because they mentioned about leaving it there for a while, believe it or not, you know, the... Uh, flag that they placed on the moon no longer has any color on it because the sun's radiation have has bleached it off so that's now just white um so so oh, just saying the kind of conditions of trying to keep something now we'll on the moon for a long time. we'll discuss two more NASA payloads, Navigation Doppler LiDAR, or NDL, and the Lunar Node 1, or LN1, later during our broadcast. We'll have a special guest later in the broadcast to talk NDL upon its activation during descent. And Josh, we did get word that some of the processing of the optical images from NDL are already performing. They did some checks, and they're performing very well. Now, a common theme you'll find among the NASA payloads on IM-1 is helping to demonstrate technologies and our understanding of the lunar landscape that could very well improve operations Cat. for landing on the moon Cat. in the future. From understanding the environment to precision sensors to literal beacons, the technology on IM-1 will help guide technologies and operations for future lunar exploration. And Gary, with CLIPS as a springboard of innovation, Intuitive Machines designed and developed its complete lunar program to help support CLIPS and carry out the essential part of that directive, which included calling for the commercial development of the moon. Back in 2018, the U.S. government declared the moon of strategic strategic interest. At that time, few companies and institutions were working on payloads designed for the moon because no one had been to the lunar surface in over 50 years. I, I find that hilarious because um, they, they only started showing interest because the Chinese started showing interest again. I mean, the Chinese started showing interest in other uh, nations. So it's not because we're suddenly really interested in it. We just don't want anybody else there to some degree years. Gary, in the time it takes to get an undergraduate degree, six commercial entities created payloads for the IM-1 mission. We'll view all of them as pioneers helping shape this brand new lunar economy. And Josh, a true lunar economy should not have just NASA as a sole customer. NASA's CLIPS initiative encourages a model where NASA is just one of many customers. And this is an important uh, element to ensure that this model of transporting incredible science and technology instruments to the lunar surface is a sustainable and robust one. Well, it's important, and Gary, it's also promising in this situation. The commercial interest for delivering science and technology demonstrations continues to grow. As of our third planned mission, we're seeing mm -hmm. more and more non-CLIPS payloads from both domestic and international companies and institutions which are driving us towards a future maybe completely commercial mission to the moon possibly as soon as our fourth mission well even on im1 there is a variety of unique commercial payloads it's a good snapshot of out of the box ways to think about what the moon can offer well that's part of the challenge beyond just creating the capability to land on the moon safely we had to look toward a new emerging ideas and find innovative ways that may add value 
on Earth and space flight. Yeah. Let's learn a little bit more about those payloads and the lunar lander attempting to make history. But yeah, it like when I was working at the museum, the Nova Sea was our version of a liquid oxygen. They had little interest lander, in going back to the moon. And we went about in the sense imagining of that into they kept pushing it off. They kept pushing it off, and then suddenly when other countries decided to get interested in it. Oh, we now are pushing it forward. To existence. Intuitive in Machines' just a few Nova years. C-Class 3D printed engine took its first breath of liquid methane and liquid oxygen in 2018 on an airstrip at Ellington Airport in Houston, Texas. We didn't have enough money for a facility with blast walls and... and so oh, by the way, when, when I'm talking about when the engine... Uh, I just remember the engine testing that I saw. No, in the sense of it was above the trees when I mentioned using the trees as a buffer. It was quite high in the air, so the, it wasn't close enough for, you know, trees to catch fire. A, a water suppression or water deluge. So we had a test outside in the, in the environment of Houston where the temperature is about 100 degrees and the humidity is like the same. And we are having an 18-hour day rolling out to the runway. It was brutal. Uh, but we did it to get the critical test engine data we needed to build our own engine. Designed, manufactured, and controlled in space by Intuitive Machines, Nova Sea's structure is primarily carbon composite. We needed to build the lightest weight structure we could. That meant honeycomb aluminum core with composite face sheets, uh, composite struts, and most importantly, linerless composite propellant tank. Man, what a challenge that was. Between the engine, carbon composites, software, and electronics required to build a Nova Sea lunar lander, it took an incredible amount of touch labor to get to the launch pad. We worked very closely with San Jacinto Community College to create a uh, certification course for technicians where they would take these certifications. We then, in the two machines, would give them an internship and uh, test them out in the workplace. And anyone that showed the aptitude to be a really good technician, we hired on the spot. Nearly all of the lunar lander's payloads are mounted to its exterior, including six NASA-provided payloads that will help lay the foundation for Artemis missions. Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University's Eagle Cam, designed to deploy off Nova Sea right before landing to take third-person perspective images. The International Lunar Observatory Association's camera system mounted at exact angles that could capture images of the Milky Way from the lunar surface. A data center technology demonstration by Lone Star Data Holdings and Omni Heat Infinity, Columbia Sportswear's thermal reflective insulation used in many of their outdoor products will help protect Nova Sea from extreme temperatures in space. All right, one of the reasons, I, pausing again, one of the reasons why gold, if you notice there's a small mining of gold in lots of the areas, those are in um, really important locations because uh, gold has a, is very good at cr keeping corrosion at bay is corrosion uh, resistance. And one of the other things is uh, it reflects infrared uh, radiation very well. Um, and it's just um, very useful, but it, it's usually very thin. It's not um, a lot of gold used on it. It's just a thin layer of it. They've got brilliant ideas. That's also the reason why you see them on the visors of the uh, spacesuits. Is. And if we can help facilitate those startups to help build this economy, I think that raises all boats. And it's as, as serving as the transportation leg to the moon, we're happy to accommodate those kinds of companies. Now, the lander and our payload customers require command and control in space. Intuitive Machines' Mission Operations Center provides both of those elements. It's called Nova Control, Nova being the name of our lunar lander class and control being the nerve center of our entire lunar program. Its unique circular design fosters a collaborative environment where flight controllers and customers may make agile decisions. Let's take a live look. Yeah, and really inside that flight control to, room, you know, Josh, it's control important that kind to of note things. that these are not the only teams that are have been in this room over the past seven days. This is staffed 24-7 uh, inside Innova Control here. There's red, white, and blue teams. That's All right. I'm never shutting up at this point. Um, I've seen this multiple times, even when I was a kid. Well, when I was a kid, I was able to actually go inside there. 
it is sta uh, when the International Sta Space Station existed and... No, well, it does exist, but when this shuttle program also existed, um, there would be a control center, it, it was um, in Hanso, um, that you could go in. And there was a viewing port for it, but... Um, like I said, since they're no longer doing that, I'm not sure if it is. Um, that you could look inside and you'd see the people working, and it was always staff. Um, and they always had contact with the uh, people on the space station and all this other stuff. Um, but uh, I think one of the people at ch my church actually worked there, or at least that's how I was able to actually go inside there as a kid um, and see. And it is very, it was a very interesting thing. Support the and uh, they, like I said, since they no longer do it, I don't know if they transferred over purely using the space station there. Also, since we no longer do much with the space station, but um, if you do a tour of the space and rocket center, I think it goes still goes by there. At least if they still just have an old mock up of what it was. Or this mission, it. Gary. The, the the mission required twenty four seven operations. We're somewhere in between the seven and eighth day. This has been three teams, red, white, and blue, working eight hour shifts, which really turned into just about everybody working twelve hour shifts each. Mm -hmm. In addition, there's another team, the gold team, that's running problems and solving solutions that are coming up in the future. And at this moment, we talked about this being a dynamic situation, using two of NDL's lasers to feed into our HRN and TRN cameras to provide a landing solution. Everyone, every asset available out of all of these teams is on hand right now to solve these intractable problems and take the best shot at the moon we possibly can. It really took a team to solve some of these, as you mentioned, a dynamic situation. Now, you talked about the design of this room, fostering that uh, collaboration. It's a little different from what I'm used to over at the International Space Station Flight Control Room, where you have consoles that are facing towards large screens. What exactly is... Yeah, I was going to say, they're kind of grouped, if I remember correctly, how the layout of that um, the international one was, was they were grouped, like, four corners kind of thing is they were um cubicles but i wouldn't say large cubicles they were um usually there was like two people in that cubicle so it was one side the other side um but they were still sectioned off to some degree but I i'm trying to do this from memory when the last time I saw it. Is, uh, the logic behind this particular design. Really, we wanted to get everybody together into where we're a small company. Uh, there's not a lot of us. This is agility is our strong suit in this situation. And this room really suited us. Is a situation where we can put our payload customers inside the center, or let's say we need to bring in operators who have knowledge of the things that need to happen in the future that we haven't quite touched on as a team. But you can insert those folks into the center of this room, make quick decisions, respond to problems, and that's really the way that we see tackling some of the hardest challenges in the world. And certainly right now for us, this is one of the hardest challenges on the moon, most certainly. Which we are saying absolutely. And it takes everybody in this room and everyone has their respective roles, just like we see with any spacecraft. Some of these, each of these individuals provides insights into a specific spacecraft subsystem. And the captain of this whole thing is usually the mission director. In this case, this is Blue Team. That is Dr. Tim Crane. He's our co-founder and chief tech technology officer serving as mission director today. Now, flight control operators continue to monitor Nova C's performance. Operationally, we're still counting down to PDI ignition at 5.11 p.m. Central Time and landing at Malapert A at 5.24 p.m. near the South Pole of the Moon. For more on Malapert A, let's head over to Leah Cheshire. Leah. Thanks so much, and I am now here with Ben Bussey, Intuitive Machines, enough. Chief Scientist, to talk about Malapert A. Thank Still you so much for joining us, Ben. It's great to be here. Now tell me a little bit about this landing site. Why was it chosen, and what sets it apart? So the, you know, the most important factor when selecting the landing site was to find a good, safe site for Odysseus to land. And we're landing in highland terrain near the poles, and that can be, that was a... a Let's say, I don't think that until the third uh, Apollo landing, 
um, that they actually did the Highlands because it, it was very a bit difficult. A fun challenge for the team, but we think we found a good, large, safe area free of boulders and, and craters. The other key factor was to try and land um, in the south polar region of the moon. If you know, um, NASA, with, through the Artemis program with their international partners, will be sending humans to the moon in this decade. So the goal was to find somewhere in the south polar region that was large and safe. And we sort of think just outside the rim of Malaput is sort of a Goldilocks location that uh, will allow all the payloads to get the data that they want to get. And you talked for just a second about that lunar highland material. Um, that's what we believe Malapert A to be composed of. What is really interesting about the lunar highlands? So if you look at the moon, you will see, um, you see bright and dark regions. And the, the dark regions are lunar mare, which are old volcanic flows. The, the bright regions are mountains, are the highlands, which actually um, represent the original four and a half billion year crust of the moon. So they're scientifically very interesting. They're also the same geology that the crew will visit. And so um, we want to go and get the first data of the highlands near the poles. And so we have one of our instruments, for example, is, is SCALPS, and Na NASA likes its acronym, acronym. So it's the stereo camera um, for lunar, plu uh, lunar plume studies. And so that camera, which is four video cameras, will image the dust of the highland terrain as right before we land. And so we will learn how it behaves as landers come down. So as we start to put multiple things near the poles, we know how far away we have to land. And we know that uh, there are some interesting conditions for these areas in the lunar south pole. That can be lighting, that can be communications, um, terrain itself. So what can we expect at Malapert A? So yeah, as you get very mm -hmm. close to the poles, the I'm lighting and communications um, becomes very challenging. And so for IM1, um, we've gone um, to about uh, 10 degrees, about 300 kilometers from the pole. And we think that's a good location because um, it's the closest to the pole that anyone's landed. But for example, we've chosen a site where you can see the Earth all the time, which is one of obviously communications being a key challenge. Whereas for IM2, our second mission later this year, we'll go even closer to the pole. So for example, one of the... Well, the interesting thing about also, um, especially with the Skylabs, is um, the first... Um, Skylab was the first American... Um, Space station. Um, I, I have a few stories about that, but we're just doing it that are combining the fact that, um, along with the idea of communication with the Earth and um, facing the Earth. But one of the things that they found um, with Skylab, of course, there are people on there for a while, and um, they brought a whole bunch of recreational stuff. Uh, well, not a whole bunch, like darts and stuff to try and using darts in space uh, I mean that's a good experiment I guess um, but the record uh, most of the astronauts came back and said that the most relaxing thing that they found was actually viewing the earth as they were spinning around um, so my guess is one of the other things is maybe the humans on there will find the most relaxing thing to do is view the earth as well so it, it it has a twofold thing. The things that we can study is, while we see the Earth all the time, it's still close to the horizon. And one of the things that communication engineers want to know is um, how communication is affected when the Earth is really close. Um, so that's one, what's one example of something we can do in support of Artemis. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today, Ben. That's all the time we have right now. We're going to send it back to Josh and Gary to talk a little bit about the landing sequence. You very did. Thanks, Leah. Yeah, Malapert A is a fascinating satellite crater to Malapert, a crater only 300 kilometers from the moon's south pole. The site is named after Charles Malapert, a 17th century Belgium astronomer. The area around the landing site is believed to be made of lunar highland material, similar to Apollo 16's landing site. Okay, I was Apollo right. Apollo 16 was the first Apollo mission to visit the lunar highlands in an Ah, I was right. I remembered correctly. area called Descartes. Scientists believe the highlands offered insights into the moon's early history. The Descartes landing site turned out to be a source of rich scientific information. Say the last one that we actually landed on the moon on. Okay, information about I, I've talked. I talked to a scientist that actually worked on the um, lunar rover. Actually, two of them. 
Um, interesting enough, they had to actually kind of redesign the uh, Lunar Lander to be able to fold, uh, to have this, which folds up, and it's left on the moon, by the way. Didn't take it back with them. Well, part of the lander does stay on the moon. Um, but to be able to fold this up, to be able to... Um, and then unfold it. I could show animations, but I'm I'm already say I'm already pushing it with the information of that. Um, but there is a volt battery in the back. Um, right, that's what that. I don't know if the cursor can be seen in the back there. Um, and basically, when they were doing testing for that right there, they used lawn chairs um, for testing purposes. Uh, instead of, well, technically, from what I understand, it's still kind of lawn chairs, um, but they're modified um, because it's lightweight and all other fun stuff. Um, let's see. Just amusing. Scientists, when you talk to them about some stuff, often have the strangest ways of, like, sitting there and fixing a problem um but anyways if you look at the wheels there those are not first of all rubber wouldn't work very well on the moon anyways but those are um remember what material? i think steel but they're woven or, no i think it was aluminum or something uh, my mind's dying on that but they're woven they're um around what would be the idea of a shape of a uh, wheel. Um, because A, that's less weight on it, and B, um, just how the lunar surface is, and the gravity on the surface. Um, but, yeah. And one of the things that I noticed on whether or not, especially I was going on about the control game on the design of the lunar lander, on whether or not it's a true lunar lander of the mission that they said it was was because of how it was designed because there's a difference between lunar landers that didn't have a lunar rover on and did and they kind of got it wrong large sample of rock hauled a north site was recovered from Descartes which solidified more than four billion years ago during the moon's formation when the outer regions were still molten. The IM-1 mission is carrying NASA payloads that may help better characterize this important scientific landing site for future Artemis missions. And Gary, we were originally targeting from NASA Oceanus Pro Solarum. It was a lunar mare in the region of the near side of the moon. The decision to move from the original landing site in Oceanus Pro Solarum was based on the need to learn more about terrain communications near the lunar south pole, which is expected to be made up of some of the best locations for sustained human presence since all the moon. Landing near Malapert A also will help mission planners understand how to communicate and send data back to Earth from a location that is low on the lunar horizon. Now we're coming up on the NDL activation. We have more information about how intuitive machines flight controllers intend to land on the moon using this NDL, NASA's navigation Doppler LiDAR. And Gary, since choosing to orbit the moon one more time, flight controllers have been working to resolve a challenge with the lander's laser range finders assigned to the terrain relative navigation and hazard relative navigation cameras. Those provide landing solutions to Odysseus. The lasers are intended to determine altitude and horizontal velocity, but the ones on the lander right now are not working. These are essential measurements required to land on the moon. And while Nova Sea's laser range finders are not operable, NASA's navigation Doppler LiDAR sensors are. So during the last two hour orbit, flight controllers have been loading software patches and resetting the lander's guidance, navigation and control system to use two laser beams from NASA's navigation Doppler LiDAR as primary navigation sensors to land Odysseus. That's right. And we're coming up on the timeline for when Nova
Nova C is about to begin the activation of NDL. This is a three-step process from powering on, becoming ready for operation about five minutes later, and then integrating those sensors with Nova C's terrain and hazard relative navigation cameras ahead of Nova C landing. So while we wait, let's learn a little more about NDL. So the Artemis program has taken NASA back to the moon and everything that goes there, including the instruments and people, must be flown there safely and landed there precisely. So the landing phase of that task is one of the most critical aspects of it. NDL is a LIDAR instrument that is used to enable that capability. It uses light in the same way that sonar uses sound. For NDL, we have three telescopes where light would come out of the telescope, hit the moon's surface, and some of that light will be reflected back. These telescopes are mounted on the outside of a vehicle so you get a clear view of the ground as it's coming in for a landing. In the Apollo era, large radars or astronauts using their eyes looking out of a viewport yeah, like were I said, used the to eyes. help land the vehicles. NDL is going to have to take the burden off of the crew with a much smaller, lower power, and more accurate instrument. And we just got an update from one of the flight controllers that the HRN and TRN cameras assigned to Nova C are still nominally processing images using two of those NDL lasers. Quite the feat, Gary. No, it's it, absolutely incredible and a very important milestone to reach. Now, with that understanding, let's learn more about how this technology is playing an active role in this dynamic situation. Me, let's head over to, to Leah Cheshire. Leah? Explain to me while I forget. Thanks so much, Gary. I'm joined now by Prasan Desai. He's NASA's Deputy Associate Administrator for the Space Technology Mission Directorate. Thank you so much for being here. Great to be here. So let's talk a little bit about the <laughs> novel landing technology that is NDL. Can you explain that to us? Yeah, so NDL stands for Navigation Doppler LiDAR. And one of the challenges for doing any uh, space missions is knowing where you are and trying to figure it out, right? And so we're looking to de de uh, develop newer and newer capabilities that we can do that more precisely and that take up less volume and mass on, uh, on the spacecraft so that uh, you can uh, uh, have all the um, available pay uh, payload mass for instruments and, and other scientific things we're trying to do. And so this is the next generation of a new capability where we're trying to go from the traditional um, measurement using uh, radar to a laser-based system. And so Lasers. that's what this navigation type li LIDAR will be doing is sending out three laser beams to try to get the uh, velocity uh, measurements in um, the lateral direction as well as the vertical direction. So when it comes to NDL, what are some of the challenges we expect to see when using this technology? So we've tested it on the ground in a number of platforms from helicopters to uh, you know landers on here on the surface uh, on the Earth to test this out. But this is the first time we're going to test it actually in the space environment on a lunar surface, right? And so we will see how that uh, different environment will really affect the systems, right? And so um, one of the things that we would really like to know is what the uh, how the pulse comes back after they send the laser and how it reflects back to the system, how long it takes to process, and how it will uh, help uh, define the solution to d figure out the trajectory to go down to landing on the surface. Now, this technology has become a little more critical for today's mission, so can you talk about how NDL is now being used in today's landing? Right, so we put this as a tech demo with de 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 demonstration um, as a test. Right? We weren't planning mm -hmm. to use it uh, in line with the actual mission coming down to the landing, but now we are. So basically it is now the primary system to help provide the velocity and altitude information so that the lander can land safely on the surface. And that's important because as the lander comes close on, you know, we don't want it to tip over. And so we <laughs> yeah. need to get an understanding of the vertical velocity so it knows how much thrust to slow down, but also the lateral velocity, because if it comes down sideways too much, it can tip over and uh, fall. So by knowing the velocity, the lander can decide exactly how to uh, come down and hover, basically slowly to come down, and that's why it's really important to do this testing. But here we are today, we're gonna try it for the first time in line, and so we're ex excited for the mission. Yeah, a demonstration right, totally in action. Time. Yes. So just very briefly, there are two other uh, tech demos on this mission. Can you cover those very quickly? Yeah, so two other uh, uh, things that we're trying to improve on is one, uh, radio uh, frequency mass gauge, which is to try to get a mm -hmm. measurement of 
the fuel that's on, the, uh, on, on any system, any spacecraft. One of the things about uh, low gravity is the propellant doesn't settle down where like in a car, gas tank. It's on the bottom so you can measure it easy. In space, they f it floats. And so how can we do that so we know how much propellant there really is? Yeah, and then the other on one that. is scalps. One of the things that as it lands, uh, the thrust is going to throw up all this ejecta of the, the lunar, lunar regolith and thing. And so it, we have four stereo cameras that are going to take images of that and get data so that we can improve our modeling so that in future landings we can make them more safer and things like that. So we're using that as a technology demonstration as well to improve future landings to make them more safer. Well, thank you so much, Prasan. It's really been great speaking with you, really exciting stuff. And for now, we're going to send it back to Gary and Josh. Boom. Hey, thanks, Leah. Nova C is a little less than 55 kilometers from the lunar surface and about 20 minutes to power descent say, initiation, the thing a critical up there, the maneuver that marks the down. beginning of Nova C's final moments before touching down on the lunar surface. It's no secret that landing on the moon is challenging. Countries around the world have attempted this incredible feat, some Chi successful China's and rabbit, some not. I think of course, failed. the United States has landed yeah, on the moon many up. times, most notably during the Apollo program. But this may be the first landing by a U.S. commercial company enabled yeah. under NASA's CLIPS initiative. Ahead of these important milestones, let's discuss the challenges of landing on the moon through CLIPS. Take a look. Oh, good, good that it's saying Landing that now. Landing on the moon is hard. We're going back. Under this Artemis program, we're going to be sending humans to the moon for the first time since Apollo. So ahead. By the way, if you want to talk about the uh, why there is a camera uh, that does the long shot of it, um, basically the initial one that you see from him looking down and all those stuff, the more grainy one. Um, they put the camera, uh, and recreated it, um, when you see them stepping down, uh, from the out set. ...of humans, we want to get up as much science exploration and technology experiments as possible. When so you see CLIPS it from starts a facilitating a lot of the early science, the things we want to learn before we can send view. humans. CLIPS stands for Commercial Lunar Payload Services, CLPS. The services part is the key element. Ordinarily, when NASA delivers a payload to the surface of the moon, they do it with a commercial partner, but NASA controls the building yeah, of the vehicle. See. Now, we're buying the service of delivery of our lunar payload to the surface of the moon. It is a delivery service, akin to a delivery service that you'd have here on Earth. NASA will provide payloads to a commercial company. They decide how to get it to the moon. They have to develop their own lander, but they also have to manage the entire end-to-end -end mission. It's meant to provide affordable, rapid, frequent access to the lunar surface. Through affordable? No. Often they overcharge on this stuff, but I mean, it does it. Who didn't hear this from a direct, you know? former NASA scientists. Through American companies. We're funding different companies. We have commercial companies that are competing to win task orders to deliver our payloads to the surface of the moon. One of the goals when we started CLIPS was to help establish a lunar economy. Somebody has to do it first, and then it becomes commercially available. Then they're able to crank them up. Then they're able to make it more affordable. And so the lunar surface is just the next frontier for a commercial environment. But we yeah, uh, the NASA scientists that I talked to about uh, that were docents didn't have nice things to say about the private companies because basically they would faff around uh, my word for the word faff around is um, and make things more complicated than they were more or less because it seemed like they wanted more <laughs> money out of it because they got more per hour on the idea since they're a private company so often they'd have to relay it through business decisions rather than um, the scientists saying, hey, this is what we need. And they're like, oh, you think the bureaucracy was bad with, you know, government? It's apparently worse with the uh, private companies on that kind of stuff, at least back in the old times of space.
-hmm. He had to acknowledge up front, all the way through the highest levels of the agent's leadership, that some of them will fail. These missions may not be as successful as a traditional NASA mission. We have accepted the risk that going through this innovative approach with these commercial companies, that there could be some failures. Some of them are new companies. None of them have ever successfully landed on the surface of the moon. So they're going to learn lessons. Yeah, that's why I'm surprised SpaceX had been to think to it. And so that'll help ultimately or they do, buy that's down our not risk this one. as these companies learn, okay, what does it take to actually build up the lunar lander, integrate payloads, get to the lunar surface and land safely. But the thing is, I, I think that would be, if you think about how companies work, wouldn't that be, um, you know, knowledge that wouldn't be shared between companies? Uh, because uh, I guess that'd be intellectual property to some degree. So I, I don't know why multiple companies, I mean, I guess they have their own information rather than sharing it. They've been able to demonstrate that they have very, very good technical depth and the ability to design and execute missions. We're willing to take more shots on goal. And we aren't risking human lives. And in the big picture, if we're flying missions at one-tenth of the cost of a NASA mission and we fail two of them, we still get eight missions for that same price. Even with one or two or three failures, this is still a very economical proposition. Good to throw something out there. Economical. Yeah, um, I'm... I'm Good that it doesn't, you know, have problems with, you know, human lives, but I'm going to throw this out there. If you think Ocean Gate was cheap and all this other stuff of kind of being dangerous and all this other stuff, I'm quite sure these private companies are just as bad. It's just good that there's no humans on it. It's a risk posture which is more risk tolerant than NASA is accustomed to. There's not a single one of these companies that's willing to bet their mission on a coin toss. Every one of them is doing what they can in order to have the most successful mission possible. But the important thing to realize is that risk tolerant does not mean risky. And the rewards are a long-term ability to get payloads to the moon inexpensively, frequently, and rapidly. We want science, so we can then put more of our resources on even more science exploration and technology payloads and get more of a return on investment when we get to the moon. CLIPS provides tremendous benefit across the scientific and economic communities. So there's a lot we'd like to learn about the moon to help human habitation and prepare us for missions to Mars and beyond. So the moon is the first step. The teams here in Nova Control have been working diligently over the past seven days to take us this far and are laser focused on the operations ahead. We're following the clock down to the start of those autonomous operations of Nova Sea, starting with the power descent initiation. For now, we're heading back over to Leah Cheshire, who's standing by with NASA's Associate Administrator. Leah. Thank you, Gary. I'm joined now by Jim Free, NASA's Associate Administrator. Thank you for joining us, Jim. Thanks for having me. This is a big day, and what are some of the challenges to landing on the moon that people might not expect? Uh, well, it is a big day, by the way. Uh, you're right. I, I think the, the challenges are, are multifaceted. First, getting into lo lunar orbit is, is, a, is a challenge. Going to the South Pole is different than going to other parts of the lunar surface. The lighting conditions are a lot different than at the equator. So you have uh, your hazard detection has to be a little more reliable. You have to be able to do that last minute avoiding of the hazards that are on the surface and finding that right place uh, to set down. So you're also level or within the much. tolerance that you can be f uh, for level on the surface. We talked a little bit about how this is a different model for us. So how does NASA help ensure success uh, while we also allow these companies to figure out their solutions. We're, we're able to offer our technical expertise, so companies can ask for technical experts from NASA that might be an expert on lunar surface conditions or uh, orbits around the moon, or even just an assembly of the spacecraft, the vehicles. Um, but they can also ask for help during the mission. Uh, we, we provide help through our deep space network to get the communications, to bring the data back to the control center here um, to help them maybe understand their orbit better or get more communication with the spacecraft as well. So both in advance of the mission and during the mission also. And CLIPS is just one way that NASA is using uh, we're working I think to I didn't do this American live because how many so times I paused. What are some other ways and why is NASA pursuing this commercial route for complicated space missions? So we, we started back, uh, in space station where we started with the commercial cargo where we uh, spurred on investment in commercial delivery of cargo to space station that's because ported we no over longer to our cruise shuttle. line. <laughs> 
commercially. We're doing that on the Artemis program, buying things by service so that we can spur on other investment that allows us to get our resources and use them elsewhere to do other parts of our mission, exploring the moon or beyond. You talked a little bit about Artemis for a second. So how does CLIPS fold into NASA's uh -huh. plans with Artemis and with this moon to Mars architecture? I think I could talk about Artemis for hours. <laughs> but, <too>. uh, <laughs> but CLIPS is absolutely essential for Artemis. It's, it's our first steps of understanding the lunar environment. So the intuitive machines lander is gonna help us oh, understand the how clips, the lunar exactly. dust moves as the rocket I know it's probably an acronym. The exhaust of the rocket hits that. And they might have explained it earlier. We need to understand that because we're going to land even bigger landers with our humans in the future, and we want to land it close to our other elements, so we're not blowing that dust everywhere. How does it behave? So that's just uh, that's just one part of it, but it is our first step of understanding that environment that we're going to put our astronauts on the surface. And of course, we're really, really looking forward to that mission. Uh, but for now, thank you so much for joining us here today. We are going to go back to Gary and Josh to highlight some more payloads ahead of the power descent initiation. Hey, thanks, Leah. A report at 4.54 p.m. Central Time from the flight control teams shared that Nova C is less than 30 kilometers above the lunar surface and is in the lunar southern hemisphere. We're still on track for PDI at 5.11 p.m. Central Time. Nova C will perform this maneuver to slow the vehicle's descent, then pitch over and scan the landing site for hazards, making any necessary corrections in the final burns to ensure a safe landing. We've highlighted five of the six NASA payloads so far throughout our broadcast broadcast today, let's talk about the final NASA payload, LN-1. Lunar Node 1, or LN-1, is a small CubeSat-sized flight hardware experiment that integrates navigation and communication functionality for autonomous navigation to support future lunar there, surface and which orbital is understandable. operations. Lunar Node 1 is meant to be a demonstration of how we can use various navigation technologies to figure out where you are in and around the moon. It's I'm supposed holding to be my a hands setup. Uh, the Lunar Node 1 mass getting. simulator. Uh, we use this build uh, to test out our vibrational modes, put on a shake table, and also do fit checks uh, with the lander itself. Um, inside of our payload, we have multiple electronics boards that fit within this chassis that is a little bit about a half of you in size. Um, you can see our external connectors here where we have our data and it's power to, uh, to the lander like itself. The and within here, we have multiple boards that do power regulation, our data control, our FPGAs, all those kind of electronics pieces are in here, as well as a small S-band radio that attaches up underneath this top radiator in order to distribute this heat and then the top to the antenna which mounts here. Uh, this is the same size and build as the flight payload. Um, it's just not covered in MLI or some of the other materials that you'll see um, on the flight build itself. LN1 will test a lunar navigation concept of operations with the implementation of MAPS, or the Multi-Spacecraft Autonomous Positioning System. Ideally, this kind of technology can support a network of communication and navigation amongst local surface and orbital operations. LN1 will test multiple navigation links from the surface of the moon back to Earth to characterize both MAPS transfers as well as GPS-like signals that could support a future lunar communication and navigation network. Work. Gary, one of the best things about communication and data is getting imagery back. And Intuitive Machines has several camera systems on board, including Eagle Cam. It started as a challenge from our CEO, Steve Altimus, Eagle to Can. his alma mater, Embry Riddle Aeronautical University. Students and faculty created Eagle Cam to take an out of this world selfie of Odysseus landing on the moon. Nerds. The camera system could capture I the world's first this. ever third person picture of a spacecraft making an extraterrestrial landing. The camera system is designed to deploy off of Nova C approximately 30 meters above the lunar surface and take images of Odysseus during landing. Additionally, the device will test a dust removal system which could lead to the future advances in spacesuit technology. As part of this project for Eagle Cam, Embry-Riddle teamed up with NASA's Kennedy Space Center to demonstrate the NASA-developed electrodynamic dust shield, or E. EDS. EDS uses an electric field to remove dust. The technology was tested aboard the International Space Station and will be the first ever demonstration of EDS technology. I was about to say, that's one of the problems they actually had with um, Mars landing stuff is, or I'm not sure if it was the first one, uh, but they were afraid that they lost it because of the dust, but managed 
to finally get signals from it. So. On the lunar surface after landing. Intuitive machines also had several cameras on the lander, including wide and narrow field of view cameras. They started the mission with incredible imagery as the SpaceX second stage deployed our Nova C lunar lander, capturing iconic images of the Earth after separation. It requires a lot of planning, work, and just a hint of luck. <laughs> Payload integration managers programmed the lander's wide and narrow field view cameras to take five quick images every five minutes for two hours, starting 100 seconds after separating from SpaceX's second stage. Out okay, of all of those images that were taken, from. we ended up with just four inspiring ones to show humanity's place in the universe. And right now, we're a little in more than words, 10 minutes from power descent initiation. Let's go to Leah Cheshire one last time for the final interview ahead of this critical maneuver. Leah. Thanks, Josh. I'm here now with Nikki Fox, NASA's Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's a great day. It is a great day. And you're watching this with leaders from NASA and Intuitive Machines just very close to here. Um, what's happening in the room right now just before these final descent maneuvers? Panic. Oh, it's, there's just excitement, Dress. anticipation. Um, you know, everybody knows landing on the moon, going to the moon is hard. And we're already celebrating because this mission is already a success. You know, this is our, we've launched, we had a beautiful launch. Um, we've taken great science data all the way, every single challenge. The team has, has really risen up and solved it. And now we're in lunar orbit you know, minutes away from starting our, our descent down to the lunar surface. So for me, so many successes with this mission already. So just a lot of excitement. I'm loving that. <laughs> so we are working with these American companies in a very unique way. Um, these are challenging goals, and some people would probably consider this a bold endeavor, but what does it mean to you when you look at pursuing challenges in a bold new way? Bold. I mean, you're right, it is, it is bold. It is a new way of doing science. It is a partnership with um, totally new companies who haven't done these things before and we are partnering them with them and they are taking our science it's a way for us to get more science and more technology to the moon quickly so it's faster it's very cost effective it's very efficient um, we're on our way uh, we've got the six payloads from NASA um, and we're excited to get them down there with every new thing we do there's always a challenge there's always risks this is a high risk but super high reward and it'll get tons of science um, on the surface and for my NASA science, um, this is exciting because our Artemis missions and our lunar science touches all five of our science divisions in, in very profound ways, so super excited. You said high reward, so I wanna talk for a minute about the valuable scientific insight that we can get from the moon. What is that? What does it mean for NASA? I mean, there's, there's so much we can do on the moon, uh, particularly where this one is going down to the South Pole. Um, we think we're gonna find great volatiles down there. So as we get prepared to send our astronauts in the um, sh there, shade areas, then we know that there's water there and we can use oh, that she said water, it. Okay. which is very heavy to carry. So it's really great if you can use it on the moon. Um, we can break it up into hydrogen and oxygen, use it for fuel, um, really great for our sustainability, but also uh, this, the, where they're going is one of the oldest regions of the moon, about 3.85 billion years old. So we can actually learn about what, what our solar system was like before life started. Life is very noisy. We're very, very noisy here on Earth. The moon uh, I know, is just we're destroying like pristine, this place, aren't we? And so we can really do some amazing science. I look forward to learning more about it. So any final words before we wrap it up? Just thank you. I mean, literally, thank you. This is um, this is such an amazing team. Um, you know, thank you to to the the people that put the science uh, and the technology experiments on with us. Those teams. Thank you to the commercial teams that put their instruments on and are riding with us. Thank you, of course, to Intuitive Machines for this just beautiful, beautiful lander. And uh, thank you to SpaceX for a, a beautiful ride to to space. It's it's such an it's incredible SpaceX? effort. Um, all one. I don't know. I'm a big bundle of emotion. <laughs> Go okay, NASA, so SpaceX go Flitz, had something with go it. Go OD, go Intuitive Machines. I'm with you all the way. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us here today. Now we are following Intuitive Machines flight controllers during Nova C's final descent. So back to Josh and Gary. Thanks a lot for that, Leah. During rocket. that interview for folks at oh. home, we did hear that there was a maneuver to burn attitude, which means the lander is starting to make the positional requirements needed. 
and we're going to start listening into the IM1 channel so folks at home can hear. We just heard from flight controller about five minutes until Down, TIG. Altitude of 10 kilometers, downrange 1,100 kilometers. TIG being time of ignition, so we're inside of five it minutes. It might be very quiet during five minute dead pins. I don't Take know minus much of this five stuff, so. minutes. We are standing by for powered descent initiation. Gary, this is a critical 11 minute burn to slow the lateral velocity such that Nova C can pitch over for further operations. And while we were in that interview, we did hear that the main engine gimbal checkout was completed. So now we're focused on the operations with Nova Control. For folks at home, we are listening into the live channel there. Woo! That's right. A lot's happening in Nova Control. We're going to be hearing these status calls periodically as we follow the flight control teams. That are monitoring Nova C's descent towards the lunar surface. A lot's happening, Josh. Of course, we have this 11-minute burn. We're focused on the propulsion elements of this PDI. At the same time, the spacecraft is oriented in such a way that it can use a technology called terrain relative navigation to scan the environment along the way. What's happening there? Right, so we know that we needed terrain relative navigation then when we were descending and coming down to the lunar surface. Now this involves two pieces. You have a camera and you also have a laser range finder. At the top of the show we started talking about hey, the laser range finder that intuitive machines put on Nova C, it's not operating. We made the decision for flight controllers to utilize two of the laser beams from NASA's NDL laser. payload, make the software patches required to reassign those lasers into the TRN and HRN cameras in order to give us an opportunity to land on the south pole of the moon today. Gary, is quite the feat and challenge overcome in just about two hours because we elected to delay that orbit and go into another orbit. That's why the show was a little bit later. It appears to be paying out. The last call-outs that we heard, Gary, uh, we're talking about getting beginning processing optical images, and that was nominal. The last time we heard that was just Ooh. about 20 minutes ago. The status I'm checkouts of these critical systems are essential to understanding the performance. The folks you see now on your view, this is Nova Control. They're monitoring every step and all the data coming from Nova C ahead of PDI, which is scheduled just a little bit after 5.11 p.m. Central Time. Exactly yeah, we're, what we're running are these folks the looking at, Josh? Well, right now, everyone's looking at their assigned screens, and all of I them are tailor-made generally. There's a few who are looking at the same type of screen, but they're tailor-made for their task. You have Spark looking at electronics, things like how hot are the electronics, payloads are monitoring different parts and pieces. In five this degrees of burn attitude. Five degrees left until burn attitude. The vehicle's still getting oh, ready for this PDI there, ignition, right, demand, which we expect here in just about two minutes. Gary, two, two minutes. So these, everyone's looking at their screens and doing their respective do jobs and reporting up into the mission director while the activity director is keeping in touch with everybody and making sure Did we're putting this whole thing together. Press started. It's a call for tank press started just a little bit before that, Gary. We did hear that they were working on the cryo fill. So these are all steps that are leading towards PDI, powered descent initiation. We expect that to take about 11 minutes where we're slowing Nova C's velocity approximately 1,800 meters per second. And that's required to get this lunar landing this. opportunity in just a few minutes. 90 seconds to that's take propulsion takes the flight pressure. All right, 90 seconds until we begin that propulsive maneuver. Again, power Read descent initiation is. is about a 10 or 11 minute burn that will slow the spacecraft's descent. A Feel lot's going to happen after that time. 10 minutes, Josh. Uh, this is a single continuous burn. After that, we're gonna see a lot of events in rapid succession, pitch over, vertical, and terminal descent. And we just heard another call out from the prop console saying that feed line prep is complete. What that means is Nova C's propulsion system, that mixture of liquid methane and liquid oxygen, that feed line is prepped, getting ready to go into an injector to blend those two propellants and the propellant and the oxidizer and have ignition of PDI. We're tracking that in just under a minute, Gary. Woo. And it zoomed in so I can't see. On burn attitude. Try and figure out. Lander is getting into the correct Pilot, attitude required. Prep complete both sides. Quarter? Another call for feed line prep complete for liquid methane and liquid oxygen in preparation for this PDI burn. Fifteen seconds, exec mode. 15 seconds to exec mode. We're tracking a little less than a minute, though, until the time of ignition for power descent initiation. Settling. 
Ignition. Throttling up. Main stage. There we heard main stage ignition. That's coming from our prop yeah. console, Rob good Bournemouth. Control. GNC call on good control. Thrust to weight 1.5. These are great call outs in hey. between our prop console <laughs> and our flight right manager, here. Scott Tamblin, He's calling it as know, the data is feeding into the lander, which means I'd we are continuing to have good communications. The lander is sending that back to flight controllers in Nova Control. Gary, something we prepared for, we planned on, is that loss of communications. And that's why we have this. I see good, good thrust control. It's a good thrust control call from prop, but that's why we have this autonomous lunar lander. You know, we program, we know that, hey, we want to light PDI in this moment. These are the steps you need to get there. But from here in, this is an autonomous lunar lander and flight controllers are monitoring communications and tracking the progress right along with the public right now with us. Nova C has the helm. It is in control and is making the decisions necessary to ensure a soft landing. We heard uh, call outs about thrust, full thrust right now. There is the ability to thrust throttle that thrust, and we'll see that throughout the descent as the uh, fuel tanks continue to unload and we expel that propellant. Yeah, it gets lighter and lighter and lighter, which makes it, you have to balance that out. And we did have a few questions come in about uh, how much gas we're we giving this to slow down the vehicle. And we want to remind folks that this PDI burn goes into thrust 90% goes in just about 90% right on time. So it goes in at 90% in order to, if the lander makes a decision and says, I need to slow down more and make a decision to make a safe landing, it's able to add a little bit more oomph and make that decision a reality rather than just a possibility. Fido, I'm showing 500 kilometers to target, but my display's a little bit stale. That's a mission director, Tim Crane, calling about 500 kilometers, but stating that his uh, information might be just a bit stale. About 1,000 PSI in the helium tank. It's part of the reason we're showing this animation, Josh. Of course, this is not telemetry driven. We're just showing you exactly what's happening. When, as we hear the calls, this information is relayed through the audio loops. Not enough bandwidth to do a live stream of this. So we're relying on Badly. the data <laughs> that's being fed from Nova C to Nova Control. Yeah, that data is going into the Maybe flight controllers we'll and what you're seeing on your screen right now is just to That's give you an idea of the vehicle's attitude. You heard them talking about moving to a burn attitude. This is what we expect Nova C is doing right the now. Altitude? It is a simulation in the large screen just to give you an idea the, the, of what's the happening CC over these critical altitude, approximately 10, 11 minutes of PDI powered altitude. descent no, initiation no, trying to attitude. slow Sorry. Nova C down, bring that, that acceleration down to about 1800 meters per second. And there's some follow on steps after that, Gary, it involves pitching read. over the lander using that gimbaled engine. We heard the maneuver to burn attitude followed by main engine gimbal checkout. So they'll use that gimbal to pitch the lander over and start a vertical descent. This is where we start getting a little tricky as far as there is a final approach. It may add a few seconds. It may add a little bit of time, but we are intended to land right around 1724. That's 524 p.m. Central Time. But know that there is some give and take we're also expecting, planned for, and trained for a little bit of loss of communication during this process. That's right, and, cr and that communication Especially is absolutely important. And part of the reason, and we've been stressing this, Josh, is the autonomous operations of Nova C. Part of that is when it, after it performs that pitch over maneuver. 400 seconds to go and breaking one, good control. Fido, I see TRND pause processing in flight. All right, that was the call that we were waiting for. That was our major problem we've been working on in this dynamic situation is getting those images processed from HRN camera, TRN camera, which in this case, a dynamic situation, we had to improvise a little bit and reach into those two laser beams from NDL, laser. figure out a patch while we were in lunar orbit, just about two hours, and it sounds like we are getting good readings from those images. Absolutely remarkable feat. We also happened here, I think it was 400 seconds remaining. That was coming from uh, FIDO and Flight Dynamics, Sean Stewart working the console this evening. This is excellent calls to hear. Hazard relative navigation is going to be used after the pitch over maneuver. This allows Nova C to make some decisions and scan the landing site underneath it and make decisions in, a, in an area that calculates the uh, terrain to make sure that it's landing in a safe landing zone.
Right, so we finish up PDI, pitch over, and we have to use that hazard relative navigation, a critical tool in order to land on the moon to make those decisions, right? There's no human eyes, human elements deciding, okay, I see the hazard, I need to steer this way, or maybe press the gas, press the brakes. This all happens autonomously, and this is a huge requirement and a great call out to hear about the HRN camera system and processing those images. Right now, I am tracking 516 p.m. Uh, we expect PDI to go until about 521, 522. 300 seconds and breaking one. Ooh. Or about 300 seconds to <laughs> approximate those numbers. Very precise. Repeating what's being said. Uh, yes, that is usually. 522. Josh, after those final series. First to wait is 1.7. Following Probably along after those um, after critical maneuvers. Commuted thrust till 90%. 90% thrust. We'll hear those call outs periodically. We started at full thrust, 90%. It's still throttling. Nominal. And good performance on that engine. Take. That's a great call out. Two things there, nominal performance on this engine as well as the helium tank. So what we haven't mentioned so far in the show is that the helium tank pressurizes that liquid methane and liquid oxygen tank. But in addition, it's also used for reaction control system. Those are the small spurts that you see at the top of the lander in the animation that control the vehicle's attitude. So for things like landing on the moon, you really wanna land at the right attitude. That way your antennas are facing back direct line of sight to Earth and you can get that ultimate confirmation once you do suspect that you have landed on the moon. Suspects. The antenna alignment is an impo important element of landing on the moon, Josh. We're expecting the high gain antennas to be pointed towards Earth to confirm, but there may be a delay. We are expecting some sort of delay. I had just talking to the mission directors about how quickly we could receive a positive confirmation after this landing process is through. And there was some dispute over how long the earliest was just about 15 seconds after we see timing of when the event is supposed to happen. So right now we're tracking about 524 p.m. Central Standard Time. So maybe anywhere from 15 seconds after that, maybe a, a few minutes, two to three minutes minutes while we work to acquire that signal because as you mentioned the lander is going to a general area nine kilometers altitude nine kilometers altitude call from tim crane the lander is going into a general area that we say this is the general area we want you to fly to it's using that hazard relative navigation to make better decisions about this is an area with the least amount of right, slope. I know I'm not this is an area that's I'm... free of boulders and other obstacles <laughs> so it's making autonomous decisions about where to go three minutes to go breaking one three minutes call Just to wrap that up, when the lander is making those decisions, Gary, it's also very difficult to track. We've been very fortunate thus far tracking communications to this point. To, put, to wrap that up, Josh, uh, three minutes, that brings us to just shy of 522 p.m. Central Time. We should uh, hear that the power descent and initiation burn is complete. Then we'll begin the next series of maneuvers to get us towards vertical and terminal descent. It starts with the pitch over. And just Wonder looking at our notes here, the, we did go it? into this burn expecting uh, pitch over at 521 so and 57 seconds. So good call out on the timing of that Whether maneuver. It it's important to remember PDI starts an well, engine burn dropping it. that does not stop until landing. landing. So this is a throttleable liquid methane, liquid oxygen engine. We lit the engine at PDI and while we are changing into a pitch over, vertical descent, and terminal descent, and that landing, that is a throttle down to the lunar surface. And when we do get out of PDI, if we hear that call of PDI complete, good burn, everything after that is going to happen in very quick succession, Gary. The time it takes to go from pitch over to landing, or what we estimate landing to be, um, just looking at maybe 90 seconds is what we expect nominally. There is, some, touchdown. there is some wiggle room. Uh, Three. By the way, uh, I, I kind of feel bad now that I think about it. Um, that I didn't mention, there were two other people that died with Gus Grissom in Apollo 1. Remembering their last names, but I'm not remembering the, their first names. The main reason why is in Huntsville and Madison, we have 
school is named after him. Um, we also have Challenger, of course. Challenger. And um, Columbia, all that jazz. Um, okay, Gus Grissom, Ed, and of course White, um, and then and then Chaffee. Um, uh, Gus Grissom, Grissom is a call. Uh, I mean, high school. Um, White, I think, is an elementary school. And I think Chaffee is. Roger uh, B. Chaffee. Edward H. White II. Roger. And Gus Grissom. Three minutes to touchdown call from the mission director. For an on-time landing that sets us a little after 5.23 p.m. Central Time. Right, our notes going into this burn, 5.23 and 25 seconds. The autonomous operations, Josh, sets this to a clock. This is exactly what we got relayed before the start of Still our coverage today. Still processing. We're right on track. Depause, terrain relative navigation measurements. Excellent call out. That solution that flight controllers were working so Ooh, hard on to make sure HRN was working, pulling on extra also resources that weren't originally planned for from those two laser beams from NDL. It appears and sounds like that solution is working, and the people working to patch that software were certainly under pressure. The clock was ticking as we went into that extra lunar orbit. It wasn't a situation where we could just sit in lunar orbit and try to solve our problems indefinitely, and it's sounding good so far on the call. Two minutes remaining. Till touchdown. Two minutes to touchdown. That required a patch to be designed on the ground and uplinked to Nova C to confirm that those laser sensors on NASA's uh, navigation Doppler LiDAR could be routed to the terrain relative navigation and hazard relative navigation. That callout is fantastic. Friday, you have an altitude reading. Altitude reading. Standing by to see if we can get an altitude reading from Fido here. That's Flight Dynamics Officer Sean Stewart on Blue Team. I feel like I should explain what a Doppler radar is. It's mostly used, by the way, for uh, weather, but they use it also for obviously this. Confirm that looked like a pitch over gimbal. Let's do it. Sounds like we have some data that confirms pitch over. This starts the HDA process. That's hazard detection avoidance throughout this show. You've heard Gary and I talking about the problem that was attempted to be solved in lunar orbit, making the decision to not only postpone this show. NDL indicates altitude of 1,000 meters. 1,000 meters call out from ND. But a Doppler radar, I, I just had to look it up just to make sure, is... Um, it basically sends out pulses, um, and the echoes return because water uh, reflects, um, and that's how they tell about certain things like that. Um, I just found out that there's apparently a new Doppler system they use now, um, but it was used back in World War II. It's pulse Doppler radar, um, but it's based after the Doppler effect. Um, Polsky, how are you? Too. I, I'm being a nerd right now. Uh, it's almost to the end of this, but um, and of course, if you learn Doppler effect uh, about how um, the frequency of a wave with um, the person who's listening for it or the observer, I think is the technical term, um, relative to the source of where the wave is coming in. Um, and how they use it with weather Doppler effects, because when I was a kid, I wanted to be a meteorologist, is it usually what they're um, checking for, like I said before, is the reflection against the precipitation or the water. Um, but apparently, since I looked it up just to make sure, um, they've changed to a pulse Doppler radar system recently, apparently, because Doppler systems have been used since World War II. Um, um, I didn't know that they use it for wind. Whoa! Um, anyways. Um, how are you doing? I, like, by the way, this is a 
right now at two hours and 13 minutes um and this broadcast is only one hour and 20 i mean one hour and 47 minutes and we're already this far i had a lot of stories that i was sharing at the beginning of this um because i used to work at uh the space and rocket center in huntsville alabama which is uh, obviously a space museum as a guide so i ended up talking with a bunch of uh because um uh retired nasa um, engineers and scientists would um, be docents at the museum so when it was slow time i would get to talk with them um so some of the information i was sharing was stuff i heard directly from them i'm sorry you didn't sleep the whole night that sucks DL that is coming from flight management. This is a system right now. NDL was not understand. intended to be the primary landing system on this. Instead, we're using two laser beams from NDL and feeding that into that. Yeah, way back when. It's been a bit. It's been a bit, but um, I'm trying uh, to recall all the stuff that I did as a museum guide. Um, I had a brain injury between then and there, so uh, it's... Um, bits and pieces uh, that I do remember I talk about, but I can't say I remember the entire tours I used to give, so sorry about that. That hazard detection and avoidance system that you see on your screen right now with the lander making autonomous decisions about where it wants to land that is generally... Less than one minute remaining to touchdown. Less than one minute remaining for touchdown. And again, that's the time of touchdown. It may take some time to actually confirm the status of the lander. And in this process, we do have a deployment of Eagle Cam attempting to take the. Hey, I haven't seen the whole thing. If you, and it's obvious. So I already know that it. Uh, spoilers are it lands correctly, but I mean, just leading up to it's fun. Third person Watching. images of Nova C going down to the lunar surface. We are Eagle inside Cam. of one minute, Gary. Okay. Eagle Cam is uh, the thing that they mentioned earlier about, um, if I remember correctly, about the, the alma mater of the founder. They had the students create a camera that could basically do a selfie of it when it was coming down. So I guess that's when they, uh, they've just... Oh, it's already explaining that! <laughs> aha, aha, aha. Okay. Less than one minute remaining for touchdown. Everything. I, I'm a nerd. I love learning anything and everything about it. In fact, sometimes during streams, because I mostly do, uh, uh, variety gaming streams, um, but I will randomly pull up articles that I have saved of recent space, well, science and all this other stuff space, besides space, but mostly space information that has just been revealed. So, um, and I'll start talking about it during <laughs> something in the game would remind me. I had that problem a lot with Nier. I haven't finished Nier, but I start bringing stuff up um, during Nier just cause, um, but I'm, I'm a nerd for all of it. And thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate, hun. Um, but I do stream uh, Wednesdays uh, through Saturday. I mean, Sundays. Oh, I've also had problems talking about space stuff while doing Honkai, but... Uh, what about you? What do you like most about space? And again, that's the time of touchdown. It may take some time to actually confirm the status I of the lander. I went back a bit. And in this process, we do have a deployment of Eagle Cam attempting to take the third person images of Nova C going down to the lunar surface. Oh, did you hear the um, news of, okay, I'm, I'm nerding out. I am sorry. <laughs> um, what they found about uh, the, in the kill, uh, Kipper Belt? Hyperbelt. I mean, it's not technically planets, but I mean, dwarf planets. Is you you didn't let, let me see if I can pull up the article where it was, because uh, I'm remembering something 
they found that there's also like two dwarf planets that they've it's not recent that they found that's bigger than the um Pluto, but uh And find the article so I can get the exact information for you. So I'm not completely. Oh, no, that, that's completely fine. I understand. English is my first language, and I don't do it well, so... Eh. And the article. Like I said, I, I want to get the all the information correct on that side of things. Because it, it, it's a load of stuff. But it, it's something new. Years ago. There's something else besides that one. I have the other thing that came up, too. Okay, distant objects show solar system extends farther than we know. Something else. Oh, yes, here we go. There's two different things. No, wait, this was last year. Um, but it'd be interesting for you. First language is Polish. Say... <laughs> That's understandable. I, I can't learn a new language, apparently. My, my brain doesn't quite work with that. Um, scientists find a dwarf planet with an impossible ring, and they're unsure how it exists. Rings in the solar system are not exactly rare. Half the planets have them, or may have had them in the past. Some asteroids even have rings. And so does the dwarf planet ha Hamia. Um, now, I'm going to mess up these names. I am going to mess up these names. I am sorry. I failed at phonics, and I'm dyslexic, so... Uh, yeah, asteroids have wing rings. Um, that they're big enough to have it. Um... Lotar, a small p dwarf planet beyond a uh, dwarf planet that hangs out in the Kuiper Belt beyond Pluto, is also circled by a dense ring, a ring circling at a distance so great that it should be stuck together as a moon. The discovery means that scientists must revise their understanding of how moons and rings form are affected by gravitational interaction with their larger companion. Quotar. Uh, Measuring just 1,110 kilometers, or uh, 690 miles across, was discovered in 20, uh, I mean 2002, and over the years has turned out to be quite the interesting ball of rock. It shows signs of ice volcanism, and even has a moon of its own, called Weawat, which is just 170 kilometers across. Um, but then in 2021s. Astronomers noticed something else. As um, they were watching the planet, a dark shadow in the far reaches of the solar system moved into position to obscure a star way off in the further, far distance, a type of observation called an occultation. Observations from a ground place telescope in Australia suggested that the dwarf planet might be harboring a ring. Um, but they couldn't, you know, find evidence just by looking, obviously. Um, so they basically 
use data from a whole bunch of uh, other telescopes. Um, and basically combine the data to be able to show that there was a ring around it. Um, the data allowed the researchers to characterize the ring, and this is where things got really weird. The ring is orbiting the dwarf planet at a distance of about 4,100 kilometers from the center, or roughly 7.4 radar radii. Uh, Radar, <laughs> the ratio, <laughs> and the thing is, it's it's um, moon itself is actually much further out of a distance of twenty four radii, but Hotar's Roche limit. This is talking about geometry and circular stuff. As I actually made an A in this, so I kind of can understand. Um, but the Roche limit is just one. 1,780 kilometers from uh, her center. The Roche limit is a critical distance from the body in which tidal forces, that is gravity, will pull apart into messy piles of debris as the gravity of the larger body exceeds the gravity required to hold smaller bodies together. Once a sizable object crosses the Roche limit, you can reasonably expect it to be reduced to rubble as soon as that is soon teasing into a ring. Outside the Roche limit is what you should find are intact moons. Sure, debris can exist past the Roche limit, but it should be still clumped together in a relatively short period of time, just a few decades, and fuse into a moon of sorts. No other solar system body has rings outside the Roche limit. More research will be need to be done on why the ring hasn't turned into a moon, but there are several possible explanations. One is that the rubble makes up, that makes up the ring is, for some reason, more likely to bounce off each other than stick together. Another possibility is that Wayot, the moon, is for, or, or even a uh, as-of-yet-undetected moon. Yeah, I, I, I am a nerd. It, it is, absolutely, is providing a gravitational uh, permutations that keep the collision speed in the ring high enough to prevent clumping. But discovery also suggests there are more rings out there orbiting smaller sy solar systems and have yet to been um, defined. Okay, now let me pull up the one that uh, was like a day or so ago. I'm a nerd. I, I really enjoyed working at the Space and Rocket Center. Um, Okay, New Horizons is the probe that is the farthest out we've ever been. Um, but data from the New Horizons probe as it sails serenely through the Kuiper Belt hints at unexpected levels of particles where dust ought to be thinning out, suggesting the donut-shaped uh, fields extends significantly farther from the sun than e <laughs> previous estimates suggest. It's the most recent in a growing body of evidence that our understanding of the outer solar system is lacking, but could help us better understand our planetary system and others out there in the wider galaxy. New Horizons is making the first direct measurements of interplanetary dust far beyond Neptune and Pluto, so every observation could lead to its discovery. The idea that we might have detected an extended Kuiper belt with a new whole new population of objects colliding and producing more dust offer another clue in solving the mysteries of the solar system. <laughs> it's the most distant regions. The Kuiper belt is characterized by high-density rocky icy objects. Icy because, of course, it's so far from the sun. It is filled with large rocks and dwarf planets and a whole bunch of objects that we can't really see because they're relatively small. And it's very dark out. But dust can tell us far... Uh, far... <laughs> but dust can tell us a fair bit about what's going on. The Kuiper Belt was already thought to be pretty huge. It starts at the orbit of Neptune, some 30 astronomo astronomical units from the Sun, and extends outward for an unknown distance. However, the main region was thought to be peter out about 50 astro astronomical units. 
New Horizon, um... Uh, the okay. It visited Pluto, which orbits the sun at an average distance of 39 astrom astronomical units in 2015 and kept going. In January 2019, it flew by a strange object called, named Ar Arakoth? I don't remember hearing that. As I proceed to open. Oh, I also forgot. No, wait, that, that that's later. I'll read about that one later. Um, but I think I've nerded out enough with this, <laughs> um, but um, let's finish with this. Which orbits the sun at average distance. They've recently found something on Arakoth, now that I remember, because I recognize that name. Um, at an average of 44.6 astrological units. Since then, the distance of 45 and 55 astronomical units. Um, New Horizon keeps collecting data. And um, the Venetian Burley student dust counter is detecting way more dust than scientists expect to be at that distance. A high density of dust means that there needs to be either extra dust being produced or solar radiative forces that are unexpectedly pushing dust from the denser regions out into space. Thank you. I appreciate. Like, like I said, when I, I know I didn't do it live for this because I knew that I'd keep stopping, and like sharing stories that I know. Um. So that, it's a good thing we didn't do it live. <laughs> um, the most likely source of any extra dust would be interactions between larger objects, like collisions, for example. That means there needs to be enough icy rocks out there that they come together with relative frequency. More recent telescope observations have started to suggest the inner main region of the Kuiper Belt may extend as far as 80 astro astronomical units. Meaning the disco this discovery is consistent with hits that it might be larger than expected. As of writing, New Horizons is more than 58 astronomical units from the sun. It's now in its second extended mission, operating past uh, initial expectations, and is still sending data home. Hi, U.S. Homeland Security. Thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate. Um, scientists hope that it will last at least as far as 100 astronomical units, and perhaps if we're lucky, as far as the very edge of the solar system. That's adorable, but, um... We'll say, good that I won being too cute on this matter, but... Um... Do I get my Miranda rights out of this? Do I, do I get to call my lawyer? Oh wait, no, it's the Homeland Security. You don't get any of that shit. <laughs> How are you doing, hon? Oh, I forgot where I'm going. Extended crops. Okay, yeah, I already read that part. Um, you know what? I'm just gonna nerd out and show off the thing that they found recently about the Arach. I wonder how they come up with some of these names, because that, that, that feels like a Klingon name. Oh, it's been wonderful, and I'm excited about this whole thing that I've kind of halfway stopped halfway through. Um, just talking about space, because I'm just a, I'm a nerd about space. Oh my god, I love it so much. And the fact that this landing gave me an opportunity to stream and just talk about it <laughs> makes me even more happy. So, yes, nerd. Oh my god, such a nerd. It, it need need nerd help, maybe. Who knows? <laughs>
that they found Oh, I found the other one that I was looking for originally. Um, dwarf planets in our solar system um, past the orbit of Pluto. Um, now scientists have discovered that two dwarf planets may be keeping secrets. Uh, this might interest you in Polsky. Um, Eris and Makemake are dwarf planets that, like Pluto, yeah, Pluto, Pluto hang out in the Kuiper Belt, and also like Pluto, they have now been found to exhibit evidence of oceans sloshing about beneath their frozen cr crusts. That evidence is lurking in methane frozen on the surface of tiny distant worlds that has isotope ratios consistent with internal heating. Um, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope gave us a surprise. We found evidence pointing to thermal processing in producing methane from within Iris and Makemake. I'm sorry to hear about that. That, it's like, that sucks. Hey, but isn't Poland having an, a, a bit of well, I mean, it's next to Ukraine, so, I mean, isn't it? So you're having a bit of... Oh, in Polish. Okay. Let's say... There's a bit of uh, unrest in that area, so... Not sure how well information is open, but also it being in Polish. The information I often get is from sciencealert.com. Y'all are fine? Okay. You're in NATO. Okay. I wasn't completely sure. <laughs> they, the, the, like I said, I could be a nerd, but sometimes I'm not a nerd about, you know, global politics. Okay, sometimes I am, yes, but I mean. I've started easing off on that recently. Um, both Iris and Make Make are smaller and more distant than the Pluto. Uh, we already covered. Pluto has a radius of 1,188 kilometers, or 738 miles, and orbits the sun at an average distance of 39 astrological units. Well, I understand it's in the Slavic region, um, and I couldn't exactly point it out on a map, but I know the general area <laughs> of where it is. Um... Well, I think I can actually do it, but I'm not 100%. Um, and... I do remember my World War history. Um, I used to be a really uh, historical nerd also during World War- uh, about World War II, but... Space has always been my love. It, it has been. Um, especially since I grew up, uh, in Rocket City, USA. That's not the name of it. It's Huntsville, but we help create this, uh, run the space program. And so I grew up in a good place. In fact, every, uh, year, at least in elementary school, we would have space week where we'd learn all about space and, like, at the end of the week, uh, we'd have, uh, basically, um, egg drop, where you would create these, um, little, uh, containers, and you had to parachute them down safely from the second story, um, and you had to design it yourself, and by designing it yourself, as a kid, and make sure the egg drop. You know, the egg survived the drop. And it's so interesting, like, you had to create the parachutes and all this other stuff. Thank you so much, Kawaii Shine, for the uh, raid. I appreciate I am being absolutely nerdy as hell. What were you playing? Hey, just, just throwing off my nerdy. 
Yes. <laughs> Actually, let me restart this article so everybody can join in the nerdiness rather than, you know, missing out on it. Hi, Kawaii Raid! What were you playing? Honkai Star Rail. So, so it's kind of in the same universe of me talking on, yeah, uh, yeah, talking about space stuff. Um, yeah, we were watching this, but I paused halfway through to nerd out about other space stuff that's um, happening recently that have been released. Because I actually literally saved these articles for my streams so that w we can be nerdy together on them. Gonna have the train to the moon soon. Uh, yeah, absolutely a train to the moon. <laughs> I uh, don't think so, but I mean, it'd be cool. I mean, we can near automata that and, you know, didn't the, the robot or android, no, it wasn't android, it was machine, do it all the way to Mars? The scientist guy? I don't know. Um, anyways. Starting over this article. <laughs> Roller coaster of the moon? That would be awesome. But I'm not sure how it will work since the moon orbits. Unless it was like... No, that, that wouldn't work. <laughs> now that I think about it. Um, alright. Uh... The solar system doesn't... Okay, dwarf planets at our solar system's Frozen egg edge could be hiding warm oceans. What was the idea? Huh? Oh, it, in near the game, the the machine decided the scientist machine decided to make a either a launcher to the moon or something like that. Something that connected no to Mars or whatever. Um, the solar system doesn't get much colder than the Kuiper Belt. Out past the orbit of Pluto... Oh wait, we, we are ad-breaking. I, I will give a moment for those that are... ...keeping up. But no, I literally save space articles for random times during a stream where something might relate to it and then bring it up. And technically, this uh, we're watching the view of... Uh, the first commercial space landing of a uh, lander on the moon. But I keep on stopping for stories to tell people about this stuff. I also used to work as a museum guide at the Space and Rocket Center, um, which... ...called Love and Deep Space. Sparticles. <laughs> I mean, that works. <laughs> that fits. Um, so, literally, it's, I've been sharing different stories that I've learned from there that I can remember, because after all, I had a brain injury, uh, so it kind of... There are bits and pieces I don't remember. So I, I can't give you the whole tour that I used to give them as a spiel. Um, but I've also... Uh, one of the things that were docents there were actually former um, people who worked at NASA. So I got first-hand stories from people who've worked on the space program and continued to work on the space program because there was one guy who was um, among them, one of the younger ones, that was uh, worked on the design and continued upkeep of the International Space Station. Um, but this was almost a decade ago, so... Fox years, I'm not old. I am absolutely not old. I am not ancient. I am... I am good. Um... But yes, uh... There we go. But yeah. What's a few de decades, more or less? Well, the funny thing is, when I was working at the Space and Rocket Center, um... They kept on saying that mine was the generation that go to Mars. 
We're no longer the generation that is going to Mars. They kept on pushing it back and back. Well, I, I don't blame them because government funding kept on going. And now we've more or less turned to using uh, commercials, uh, commercial uh, companies to do it. Well, we sit, take a back seat. You know, we're now the um, consultants when the commercial pro uh, companies used to be the consultants for stuff. And the excuse is it, it's cheaper. Um, yeah, it, maybe cheaper, but it, at least it gets there. I'm th throwing a dig at SpaceX. Anyways! Um, though this is a SpaceX one that managed to get there. Well, I mean, apparently they used the SpaceX rocket. But anyways, this is intuitive machines. Oh, before I... Okay, I'm going back to nerd mode. If you're looking right here on the side, that is a patch. Um, all missions that are considered a, a certain amount of uh, importance have a patch. And the original ones were designed by the um, astronauts themselves that were going on the mission. Um, so, uh, let me pull up. Did I close the thing? I might have closed the thing. Yeah, I didn't close it. Like, these are the Mercury, Mercury ones. And I, I shared a few stories about, um, of course, Gus Grissom with the <laughs> Liberty Bell sh sinking and other information like Shepard um, ending up having to use the restroom in his uh, suit because, uh, well, pee, pee in his suit because um, basically he, ev uh, they kept him strapped in for so long. And a part of the story that I forgot to mention is he had had a lot of coffee because he, he was up at, I think, one in the morning is when they started getting preparations for it. Um, and then after that, uh, they decided to create, the, you know, the diapers um, that uh, they used for up to, I think they changed the design of them in the Apollo mission using different stuff. Um, so the first American to, you know, Orbit the Earth was doing so in his own pee. Anyways, I I am getting off. I am such a nerd. I am so sorry. I love the subject. Anyways, let's get back to the <laughs> article which I'm supposed to be reading. Um, out past the orbit of, orbit of Pluto, far from the warmth of the sun, v drifts a vast expanse of icy rocks and dwarf planets, thought to be too cold to be more than a little uh, more. Little more than snowballs in outer space. As the New Horizons data, the, the farthest um, sat, uh, probe we spent, sent out into space. Um, uh, however, appearances may be deceptive. And now scientists have discovered that two other dwarf planets may be keeping secrets. Eris and, Ma and Makemake are dwarf planets that, like Pluto, hang out in the Kuiper Belt. And also, like Pluto, they have now been found to exhibit evidence of oceans sloshing about beneath their frozen crusts. That evidence is lurking in the methane frozen on the surfaces of the tiny distant worlds that has isotope ratios consistent with internal heating. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope gave us a surprise. We found evidence pointing to thermal processes produce, producing methane from within Eris Make Make. Eris and Make Make. Both Eris and Make Make are smaller and more distant than Pluto. Pluto has a radius of 1,188 kilometers or 738 miles and orbits the sun at an average distance of 39 astronom astronomical units. I, I have problems. I'm saying that word. Ah! Eris is just a smidge smaller with a radius of 1,000... Um, 1,163 kilometers. But its average distance from the sun is a whopping 68 astronomical units. Make Make orbits an average of 45.8 astronomical units, but its radius is a, is a teensy tiny... 715 kilometers. Even Pluto is hard to see out there far in the far reaches of the solar system. Smaller, more distant worlds ver 
edge on the edge of invisibility. That's why we needed to wait for uh, an instrument as powerful as the James Webb telescope. Um, it has been known for many years that the surfaces of these dwarf planets are dominated by methane ice. Because the Kuiper Belt is sitting so far away, scientists thought that the surfaces of both worlds were pristine, as they were thought to be frozen, unchanged since their formation some 4.5 billion years ago. Using the telescopes, astronomers took a spectrotropic observations of both dwarf planets in reflecting sunlight. This allowed them to measure the isotope ratios in methane, specifically the ratios of de uh, deuterium or heavy I hydrogen to normal hydrogen, known as the DH ratio, as well as isotopes of carbon. Both sets of ratios implied that methane on the surfaces of Iris and Mi'kmaq are significantly younger than the methane that would have been hanging around since the formation of the universe. Um, the moderation of the DH ratio we observed with the telescope belies the presence of primordial methane on ancient, on ancient surface. Uh, primordial methane would have a much higher DH ratio. Instead, uh, uh, I mean, the DH ratio points to a geochemical origins for methane produced in the deep interior. Um, the DH ratio is like a window. We can use it to sense, in a sense, to peer into the subsurface. Our data, data, excuse me, data suggests elevated temperatures in the rocky cores of these worlds so that the methane can be cooked up. Molecular nitrogen could be produced as well. And we see it on iris. Hot cores could also point to the p uh, potential sources of liquid water beneath their um, icy surfaces. Um, they, um, if iris and make make host or hosted or perhaps could still host warm, even hot geochemistry in their rocky cores, Cryovolcanic processes could deliver methane to the surfaces of these planets, perhaps even in geologically recent times. Um, the fact that we found a carbon isotope ratio, 13C slash 12C, that suggests that there's been a recent resurfacing. These findings strongly suggest that we may need to rethink the dynamics of our outer solar system. Scientists think the conditions for microbial marine life might exist on the subsurfaces of oceans in otherwise frozen worlds, such as Saturn's moon, I'm gonna slaughter this, Inacladius, and the Jovian moon Europa, whose cores are thought to be hot enough to produce favorable conditions deep inside. If subs subsurface oceans can exist in the Kuiper Belt, and in fact are common, the outer solar system may, might not be as hostile and hostile and in as inhospitable as we first thought. Um, after Horizons, New Horizons flyby of the Pluto system, and with this discovery, the Kuiper Belt is turning out to be much more alive in terms of hosting dynamic worlds than we ever would have imagined. And one last one, one last one, before we continue. I, I'm just so excited. <laughs> NASA's New Horizons discovered a large surprise in the Kuiper Belt. No, wait, that's not it. That's the one we read before. Uh, there's something about the... It's about that strangely named one. Hard to fall asleep to space. Oh, you did? All right, night. I hope you sleep well.
Enjoy it, sounds delicious. Yeah. I uh, hope you really sleep well. Yeah, but uh, the n nerd, I am absolutely nerd. Oh, okay. Uh, the phone, phone, phone. Oh, are we having storms? Oh, A Arakoth is an asteroid. Okay. That was a dwarf planet. <laughs> made your strongest co co coffee well isn't it i wouldn't say morning late morning um yes if it, it sounded like there's thunder so if it suddenly cuts out i am so sorry so welcome back coffee uh yes yeah, thundering i'm uh, uh, sorry 7 a.m. Okay, in Poland, I I've been to Europe, but uh, the six different places. Um, let's see, it was back when I was uh, 17. Uh, started in Switzerland, Germany. Belgium, France. I think those were the five countries I went. Um, it was like a 21 day thing. Maybe a little bit longer. Not maybe 21 days. I don't know. It was a student ambassador program. Yeah, it's, it's just I remember the time being a course. That works. That'd be awesome. Um, don't quite have money to go over there. <laughs> Yay. Oi. So, mind you, the, the most emotional place I found was, uh, if you ever get to, it's called In Flanders Field Museum in Belgium. And it talk, it's entirely about World War I. It is amazingly emotional, at least for me at that age, um, to see. Um, it's in... I... I can't believe I know how to spell this, but that's because I don't know how to say it, which is, um... Y-R-E-S, I think, is what it is. Um... So... It's a really good museum. And they rebuilt the entire... Because the entire city was destroyed during World War One, And they literally rebuilt it by the pi uh, the pictures that they had and the people living there after World War One. So it's basically the same as it was before. Almost. But it's not the same materials. But it looks... Auschwitz. Oh, Yeah. Um, definitely that kind of stuff. I'm trying to remember all the places they put around. I'm trying to remember big places in Poland. Um, well, besides Auschwitz, um, the, I think one of my favorite game developers is in Poland. Um, which is Frozen, uh, uh, that does House Flipper, which is Frozen District. I 
another interesting thing that I remember wanting to visit. Yes, I do watch anime. I haven't watched many recent shows. Um, which is... Uh, well, let me phrase that. JoJo, I guess, is... Re no, it's not. Uh, though I haven't watched Stone Ocean. I mean, it's kind of recent now that I think about it. Um, with the Stone Ocean, but I haven't actually watched Stone Ocean. Uh, but yeah, I watch the anime. I watch the anime. <laughs> That's so stupid I said that. Thing, well, one of the other things is, how to annoy young people is to add the anime. The things. How about you? Um, uh, well, I'm betting since you're asking, you watch anime. Very good, and finish this article. How did Aro Arokoth get its mounds? And this is, uh, an actual... In the Kyber Belt, this asteroid. Large mound uh, mounds abound on the surface of the Kyber Belt object... Oh, it's an object now? Is this... Hundred animes watched, rewatched. I think I stopped after the pain arc. I think I had a lot of things happening at the time, so I kind of petered off with watching anime. I actually think that is the time that I really petered off watching anime, except when the friends would get together and do it. Um, large mounds abound. Whoever wrote this article. So it's like saying seashells by the seashore. Thank you so much, whoever wrote this article. Large mounds abound on the surface of Kuiper Belt object Arakoth. Using images from the New Horizons flyby, researchers have pieced together a story of how these features came to be. Um, after New Horizons made a historic flyby of Pluto... Oh, did you see the uh, image of the back of Pluto? Oh god, my ADHD. There's a heart. See? There's a heart. <laughs> the pain arc is really good. I, I enjoyed it, but like I said, it was... Probably at a time that uh, everything was getting busy in my life, so I didn't exactly have time for anime. Um, God, I'm not, nothing like ADHD. Um, okay, flyby of Pluto in 2015. And you're like, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Wait. Say nothing like having the uh, space nerds like absolutely for um uh, flirting with each other. Um uh the spacecraft set its sights on another first, a close flyby of an object in the Kuiper belt, the ring of icy objects ordering orbiting beyond Pluto. On New Year's Day in 2019, New Horizons flew within 3,500 kilometers, about the distance between Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles, of an object named Arakoth. Um, Arakoth consists of two separate bodies, or lobes, that fused together at some point in the past. Though the two lobes named Winu and Weyu 
are appeal, appear spherical from the flyby images, observations taken from farther away suggest that they're actually rather flat, more like walnuts or pancakes. In addition to being cute- FBI, open up! <laughs> yep. In addition to being curiously flattened, the larger lobe is covered with a series of interlocking mounds, raising even more questions about how this oddly shaped object was assembled in the cold, dark outskirts of our solar system. Yes. yes. FBI is the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and they have a real questionable history with, you know, being what they've done to United States citizens and whether they're actually, yeah, uh, whether they actually were protecting us or causing us more trouble. Um, Alan Stern, Southwest Research Institute, and collaborators analyzed two New Horizon images of Arrokoth to assess the origins of the mounds. In total, the team identified 12 mounds on the larger lobe, Winu. The mounds are roughly the same size and color and have similar ratios of length to width, suggesting they share a common origin. Using computer simulations, Stern's team explored two scenarios which could account for Winu's lumpy appearance. Multiple objects about three kilometers wide colliding with the larger objects, and two, a rotating cloud of maybe five kilo kilometer wide objects gently collapsing to form a single object. Oh, that sucks. Oh my god. Like, being in the south, uh, it's... we don't get cold, and when we do, it's hell. Um... Oh, we do it kind of cold, but we don't get freezing much. Um, the first scenario generated an object that is too uniform, the mounds having been splattered and flattened in the collision. The second scenario, though, resulted in a distinctly Winu-like sh shape, because the objects came together gently and the mounds remained raised rather than flattened. This scenario also predicts other characteristics of the Winu lobe, since it's mounds of similar area that arranged in an orderly way. How exactly a gravitationally bound rotating group of five kilometer wide objects might arise in the first place remains unknown, but future high resolution simulations should provide clues that it's plausible. 30 degrees Celsius. With this type of temperature, right, let me see at the temperature right now. Though we've been going through like hot and cold phases recently a lot. It's 57, but that's that, that's uh, that's Fahrenheit. Let me switch it to. Currently, is 14 degrees Celsius here. Um, but it's also night, so that kind of affects things. We know appears to have formed from multiple smaller objects coming together. Could we be made the same way? Uh, it's the other lobe, the, sm lobe, the smaller one. At first glance, the geology of the two lobes is very different. Possibly because we know, we know, we know, yos, we yos, I, I, it is still winter here too. <laughs> but it's, it, we're, we're heading towards spring. We're, we're making it. Weo's singular large impact crater, the creation of which blankets the nearby surface with ejected material. Stern's team picked out three possible mounds along the visible edge of the lobe, furthest from the influence of the crater, but this designation is only tentative. With no missions to the Kuiper Belt currently planned, our best hope of learning more about Arakoth is by studying similar objects targeted in upcoming missions. The Trojan asteroids in Jupiter's orbit, 
which will be visited by NASA's Lucy mission and a comet approaching uh, Earth's orbit visited by the European Space Agency. Okay. Why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of the European Space Agency's comet interceptor, because this is an older one, yeah, last year, they finally got it open! <laughs> they, they were having problems because they, uh, collected the, um, you know, used an arm to grab stuff from the comet, um, but the capsule kind of was stuck closed, but they finally got it open. Um, that was a while ago, so... So we'll get more information about, I mean, they were made, like, it took six months, give or take? Or three months? It's a good many months. So we got that open with. Um. Anyways. All right, let's actually go back to, we're at three hours and this is only like a, a one hour and 47 minute video. Just uh, we are inside of one minute, Gary. Yes, we're well in the blowdown. But yet, it's, a, it's a nerd thing. And thank and you for that. And we're tracking here in the broadcast booth. The clock has reached the expected. We take a minute for comms to reestablish. Stand by. There it is, mission director beating us to it. We've reached the expected time of landing, but now is the process of waiting for comms, and we are in standby mode, as you heard it from the mission director, Dr. Tim Crane. Yeah, it's not clear. The the I know they have these cute and one minute names has elapsed over from that, the but it's hard to have, tell. Gary, of that original burn starting at PDI. Minute, you have carrier lock. Uh, what each That's of these MD roles asking are. If we I know are this one's flight the dynamics. Stations but locked on to Nova C. That carrier lock call, Gary, we expect that to come from GroundNet or Com. That conversation possibly not happening on also our public they, channel that we have access to. Uh, there's a probe, Eagle, or uh, I guess payload thing, Eagle, that they um, have already dropped that's supposed to get a third person view of this landing. Um, access to. We're just standing by to hear that so if you uh, see come that through the channels to as we actually approach. View. Almost two minutes that since we I estimated the landing time. We did get a few call outs on the side, folks coming into the room saying there was about a two minute forgiveness in our timetables. We are checking our antenna reception. Checking antenna reception. Yeah, especially with talking to people who've actually, I kid you not, as a guide, ended up with somebody actually in the museum back talking me all the way through the presentation. Like, why did you waste, it's not exactly cheap to go to this museum. Why are you doing this? In other, unless you want to feel superior of telling me that we didn't land on the moon and all this other stuff that is fake. Wait, I repeat, I kid you not, I ended up with somebody like that. Going through the museum. <laughs> In my tour group. Mind you, my favorite, my favorite tours were, um, when we basically, uh, we'd get field trip, trip, uh, groups together. And my favorite, absolute favorite time was doing those field trips and teaching those children. I, I kid you not, I enjoyed it so, so much. Um, my favorite part of the job. The other part of the job, which I hated, was when I wasn't doing gu uh, guided stuff, where I had to stay there and make sure they didn't break anything. 
uh, with some of the uh, exhibits and stuff. So stand there, not talking, boring, driving my ADHD mind insane. The reason why I got fired was because my ADHD couldn't... Well, there were other reasons besides pissing off a higher-up person, but because I couldn't not want to do something. Just standing there. Fidgeting. Other fun stuff. No, I, I absolutely enjoyed my time. Uh, how I pissed off the other person. Uh, and I, I bet if anybody goes and checks in with the... Um, on why they fired me. It's probably a bunch of other reasons. Um, yeah, Star Trip... Tri 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 you know, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say bad things about... Well, I've already revealed this a few times on stream. Um... Whether it's slander or not. One of the uh, higher ups. Uh, known for drinking on the job. This is a start off, but also known to be very much a Karen. Um, where I was wandering around, um, and there was this couple who were looking at a map. And one of the things, as much as my autistic body, I mean, mind works, is. There are certain tones that I figured out when somebody wants help or does not want to be interrupted. And there was this couple who were talking, and it sounded like they were planning out their route rather than needing help on where they needed to go. Um, and so I stood near them in case it sounded like they needed something, but I wasn't next to them because that sounded hovering and you know would be bothering them um but pretty much was still doing other things um and the karen came up to me the, the one of the higher ups and said why aren't you helping them and my response is because they don't need help they're talking to themselves, and I don't want to interrupt them. She took that offensively. And by the end of the day, I was fired. Anyways. But no, my favorite thing was being a guide and teaching people. And we're standing by, Gary. We're standing by just uh, as we approach 5.26 p.m. Central Standard Time. Given those mission director's notes of the flexibility between what we were tracking, what we were given was just about 5.24. All stations, this is MD. Please look back through your logs and confirm the last information you had, and we'll determine if this is a comm outage. This is supposed to be an hour and, that's and the mission 47 director. minutes. These are our notes here of what we believed. We talked about. I mean, th this one that we're watching right now at the, the stream, and here I am telling stories of stuff. The calm outages with the lander making autonomous decisions. This is the process of going through the last bit of data that came into Nova Control and working to verify, okay, this is the last bit of data. Where was this? Was the lander possibly going? How do we look for it and establish those communications? Nova C uses four antennas placed at the top of the lander that are designed to capture these communications. But we did expect this, we talked about it, that this is a communications challenge in it of itself. And right now we're standing by to hear that communications call out. Well, what's basically gonna happen for those bugs to pop out is like that um, Dune kind of like bug. Um, I don't remember, I've only seen Star Trek ship troopers like way back is like, it's going to dune the um, whole lander as it's trying to land. We're just a little more than three minutes from the time of the, when the clock reached zero for Nova Sea landing on the moon. And 
I pulled up a few more articles that we can read. You know, I'll be good and not read them till after this actually lands. I'd be going the whole five hours of the stream that I'm normally doing. And we just checked with our team here in the broadcast booth, decided to let's stay stuff. on this. All the chatter we are not hearing on this public channel, Gary, all things indicate that we are working to solve a communications, a possible communications uh, challenge in this moment. So we're going to continue to stand by. Oh, I have for those an older that I read a while ago. Prime one. I forgot to close Go for prime. on my phone. Yeah, I guess you polled the room looking for uh, states, and uh, we're going to go ahead and oh, cycle the ground updated, transmitter so on Goonhilly and uh, huh. do some RF sweeps. Is that your plan? That's correct. Roger, copy. And that's just what we had in mind in our notes, Gary, is right. that if we encounter a communications challenge, we mentioned how difficult it is to land on the moon and continually have those communications. What you just heard there is folks talking about using the Goonhilly Earth Station Limited uh, dish in the UK to do a sweep looking for that signal. We mentioned that autonomous process of the lander reassigning itself somewhere that it believes is safe. Going into it, we heard that the HRN camera was functioning and able to make those decisions after what was a two-hour orbit of problem solving with intuitive machines as TRN and HRN cameras, the laser range finders assigned to those. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that intuitive machines installed inside the navigation pods. The laser range finders were not activated. We went to NASA and asked to use two of the laser beams on the navigation Doppler LiDAR. That's right. And spent two hours in orbit. Team, we're going to confirm our pointing vector with our antenna for post landing. Yeah. Okay. We spent about two hours in orbit to solve that problem. We got good readings on the way down. And right now, we are working to confirm communications on the surface of the moon, roughly around the Malapert A region, that is the South Pole region of the moon. Highlands. That's right. What we do know is the power descent initiation. We were following along in the status calls. Uh, we executed a pitch over maneuver this and we're counting considered. down the clock to a landing time uh, of 5.23 p.m. Central Time. Well, Josh described those processes of working on the communications component to confirm data from the lander, pulsing the team surrounding him to check the status of Nova C and the data that they were receiving here in Nova Control to confirm landing. And part of that, Josh, as you described, is communications. We're standing by. Fido MD on IM1. QMD. Yeah, I'm looking at our uh, phase plane there for the, the last part of the flight. It looks like we had um, excellent pitch and yaw control throughout, but I did see a little bit of a roll excursion. Could it be that we landed off, uh, off angle and roll in the final phase? So I do see we head up to an eight degree excursion. Um, we're about to begin the, the roll maneuver, which is about terminal phase. The terminal phase, which is a, a large roll maneuver to get to the landing attitude. That's the latest, last data point I have. No. Um, but up until that point, we were we were really solid. Right. So, terminal phase begins at 30 meters. Okay. Hey. If I'm going to be doing this for the four hours, I mean five hours that I normally do, I'm pulling up a bunch of articles. Oh, or post HDA. Post HDA. Post HDA. 400 meters. Very good. Might need to get some tea though. And that's a great conversation confirming. Box scan. Box that's good ground network, good for box scan. Make that go. Yeah, that was good confirmation of the process that we were very familiar with, talking about the attitude of the lander, making sure that those antennas are within direct line of sight with Earth stations, ground stations on Earth, excuse me. Mission director at all stations, we're also updating our pointing vector with our dishes to make sure that they're tuned in on our final landing site. 
There's a call searching for that communications back to the ground station. This one particularly is in the UK that's tracking us. And it's important to note, Gary, that we have an, an entire network dedicated to working these communications problems. It's been active this entire mission. And the largest, most powerful dish out of all of them is about a 64 meter dish in Australia. That time to search with that opportunity with the largest, most powerful dish, we're looking at about 12 to 13 hours after our estimated touchdown. So this is a process that we could be looking and searching for the lander signal for confirmation uh, for quite some time, but we're gonna continue to listen in and stand by as our flight controllers are working with the ground station in the United Kingdom to work this issue, work this I'm gonna throw out there once again that uh, besides the few instruments that they had on the original lunar landers, one of the key factors on how they landed was they did it by eyesight, the pl pilots did. And by the way, I know that people, there are three um, people that are on a mission that in the Apollo missions, but only two of them actually landed on the moon. The other one stayed in the orbiter um, so that you know, they could reattach to each other and then uh, the part that uh, it, the land the landing gear stays on but part of it the capsule you know well command or module uh, will of course explode upwards um, and reattach to the other part. So there's always one person that is not actually landing. Problem, it's another challenge, um, very similarly to the challenge solved just to make it this far. Signs of life, we have a return signal we're tracking. And this is completely automated, so. Absolutely, completely automated. And after this lands, I might need to go use the restroom, so the warning ahead of time. We have an onboard fault detection system for our communications that after 15 minutes with lack of communication, will power cycle the radios. And then after that, for another, 15 minutes, it will then switch antenna pairs. So we have some time here to evaluate. We do have signal that we're tracking. So we'll see what happens. Well there's a great call out about the autonomous systems installed on our Nova C-Class lunar lander named Odysseus. The process he's mentioning, Gary, is very similar to the one that we were preparing ourselves for at AOS, to where the lander has systems in place to recycle its antennas, to switch if antenna that works, pairs. That, that was very similar to what we thought we were going to need to do after acquisition of signal. Um, when we separated from the second stage of the launch vehicle, if we made it to a certain point, the lander was autonomously be programmed to start taking that into its own hands and that was the and it's one of the things i remember while in europe is coffee is really good but it's so much stronger than american coffee the information that our mission director Dr. we're not dead yet about. <laughs> we're also not dead yet And the key here, Josh, is patience. It's 5.34 p.m. Mission Director Tim Crane confirming that it could take two phases of 15-minute increments to confirm the status of a landing. So we could be here, and we'll stand by. And well, the sad part about cough, uh, caffeine is there, there's a certain um, plateauing of it and then a downward slope to the degree of the abili ability to work. So you have to keep drinking more and more coffee um, to keep energized thing going monitor as nova controls to continues to work this issue yeah tense moments inside of mission Your body gets control used to it. That's the word with I was the most for. qualified folks we're but picking we up a signal from our high gain antenna and uh, <laughs> transmitter like i said english is my first language and i still suck at it it's faint but it's there so stand by folks we'll see what's happening here 
All right, we're gonna continue to stand by. Let's keep this camera on inside of Nova Control. It sounds like we are getting some kind of faint I signal. I wanna send a series of commands to reactivate, make sure we're transmitting to keep the Quasonics active. I, I'm not either. I, I'm a tea drinker, which the, I, I love different types of teas, and some of them have caffeine in them, some of them don't, so. But if I really have to do editing or uh, some other artwork stuff, I um I like si uh, Ceylon tea, which is okay. I'm gonna be a nerd about that too, which is only found in Sri Lanka. We're still standing by the last. Um, I do like. Uh, the, usually it has hints uh, if I want to be flavored in it because um, when I was a kid we used to, I used to host tea parties with my mom's tea set um, with that type of tea um, and then there's uh, of course green tea there's um, different types of black tea there's uh, what is it? Rubidon tea which is also very good and God, nerding out about everything. Yeah, let's keep watching. Last <laughs> call from mission director, Dr. Tim. Uh, dandelion tea is also pretty good, believe it or not. Tim Crane was that we were getting a faint signal from Odysseus's high gain antenna. I mean, everybody's here for the space stuff, so dirting out about something else is kind of... All stations, this is uh, Mission Director on IM-1. We're evaluating uh, how we can refine that signal and uh, dial in the pointing for our dishes. What we can confirm, without a doubt, is our equipment is on the surface of the moon and we are transmitting. So, congratulations, IM team. We'll see how much more we can get from that. Yeah. Cool. Much more we can get from Excellent that. call from our mission director, Empty Dr. Prime Tim on, Crane. Uh, IM one. And over Go to our prime. CEO, Steve Altman. Yeah, if I could just pass on a few words to the entire team in uh, Intuitive Machines at Superbab and here in the, here in the uh, Mission Control. Uh, what an outstanding effort. I know this was a nail biter, but we are on the, si on the surface and we are transmitting. And uh, welcome to the moon. Woo! I guess that's also Houston. family members and stuff. Odysseus has found his new home. An excellent call, and this is our team of Intuitive Machines mechanics and their families, their yeah. friends, everyone who has Trash sacrificed we so much to make it this to, uh, far. Looks like they have special necklaces or like uh, something that's shining over there. I guess it has to, to do with the, um, I would say the shape of them kind of reminds me of the mirror, the module, uh, I mean, they're not payloads, but they're how, Reflex. How about that call? It was Gary, that was earlier. something else, a faint signal. Talking now it's time to work on, on refining that signal. But Dr. Tim Crane, our mission director today, making the call. Odysseus has a new home. Woo! It shows the discipline of the flight controllers in Nova Control. They waited until there was absolute confirmation that there was a signal, and then that was when they took the moment to celebrate. We saw that it wasn't just the individuals in Nova Control that contributed to the mission. The contributions to enable the success of Nova Seas landing on the moon stretches far and wide. We showed, of course, some of the folks watching there, but really it extends even farther than this. A wonderful and truly amazing moment to celebrate. The U.S. has landed on the moon once again. Woo! And to Took everyone, you mentioned it goes beyond just the folks that we saw on camera waiting and working through those tense moments. Wait, uh, they no longer use Cape Canaveral, Canaveral for stuff. Um, my dad actually saw a liftoff from Cape Canaveral. Um, 
The only thing I saw was when they still did t uh, engine testing around where I uh, lived, and I was like really, really young. Um, but they moved the engine testing elsewhere. Spoiling kid Johnny. <laughs> but, um, okay, I'm going to share the story also from, like I said, uh, I, I shared it earlier, but, um, and it's not on any of the, uh, you know, panels and stuff that you read around in the Space and Rocket Center. Um, but one of the scientists told me um, when they did Saturn V testing in the area, um, one of the times they tested it, they didn't really pay attention to the weather in the sense of, oh, it's clear out in the sense of it's sunny. Um, but they didn't think of, oh, it's overcast and the reflection of sound with clouds. So when they did the test, it broke a bunch of windows, like residential windows. It wasn't just like, and it wasn't nearby windows either. It, it, it broke a lot of windows because of the reverberation, of course, the um, sound bouncing everywhere. So they, they had to pay to replace a bunch of windows. Um, and ever since then, um, they, um, station people at four different corners around to make sure that there is no clouds whatsoever in the sky. Um, before they do a test, because they don't want to replace all the windows, you know, that kind of thing. Um, which is hilarious. Um, also, a small fact of how uh, horrifying the vibrations are. Besides, you know, breaking your eardrums um, and all this other stuff, the amount of vibrations, if you're close enough, will literally liquefy your insides. It isn't just, oh, broken eardrum, all this other stuff. No, it, it, liquefaction. Absolutely. moments but their friends their the families and everything it took to get to this point minutes. we're still expecting an image we expect that to come down sometime in the future especially as we look towards uh, some high resolution images oh they might not have it on the let's stream, go ahead and um it sounds like we do have a message we'd like to cut to can we have that message uh, special for our folks uh, our employees and folks watching at home hey that's right with nova c landing at malapert a congratulations like you said josh are flooding into the teams that made this happen really sets a tone for the american leadership and the future of a strong lunar economy so here's nasa administrator bill nelson on the eighth day of a quarter million mile voyage, a voyage along the great cosmic bridge Ew. from the launch pad Look. at the Kennedy Space Center Familiar. to the target of the south pole of the moon, a commercial lander named Odysseus. The reason why I say that, my dad works at NASA. Now, before you say, oh, he's involved in the space program, no, he is not. NASA has a whole bunch of departments that work on a whole bunch of stuff, believe it or not. Um, they use satellites and stuff to help and all this other stuff, but it's, it's still technically NASA. So bring, bring your child to work day. I also got to meet a bunch of people. But no, he... So, but I mean... So sometimes I wonder if I've met some of the higher ups before because so that haven't retired yet. Powered by a company called Intuitive Machines. Oh, my dad's retiring at the end of the year, I think. So I might meet them at his retirement party. Who knows? 
launched upon a SpaceX rocket carrying a bounty of NASA scientific instruments and bearing the dream of a new adventure, a new adventure in science, innovation, and American leadership in space, well, all of that aced the landing of a lifetime. Today, for the first time in more than a half century, the U.S. Yeah, I've has met a few astronauts to the moon. more than once. Before Today, for I the first time in, in the Rock history Center. of humanity, a commercial company, an American company, launched and led the voyage up there. And today is a day that shows the power and promise of NASA's commercial partnerships. Congratulations to everyone involved in this great and daring quest at Intuitive Machines, SpaceX, and right here at NASA. Woo. What a triumph. Odysseus has taken the moon. This feat is a giant leap forward for all of humanity. I don't know why I say I, Stay. I, I don't like the term taken the moon because, I mean, the Chinese sent a probe recently. It didn't land or didn't make it correctly. I think it was called Rabbit or whatever. And the Japanese recently did another one. So there, there, there's other countries that have done this. And, and like I said earlier in the stream, I think the only reason why we're going back there right now is because other countries are going there or have said they're going there. Kind of like how we didn't want to, you know, do the space stuff until, you know, Russia did it first. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, ads are about to start. So what I'm going to do is watch the end of this and then probably use the restroom. Usually when it says it's about to start, All right, thank you, always. Administrator Nelson. Again, Nova C and the United States has landed on the moon at 5.23 p.m. Central Time today, February 22nd, 2024. Congratulations to Intuitive Machines on the successful landing. Science and data gathering is already underway and will continue for roughly seven days on the lunar surface, activating payloads and gathering important scientific data to help ensure future successes in Artemis better. mission. For more about NASA's CLIPS initiative, visit nasa.gov slash CLIPS. Gary, it's been quite a journey <laughs> for all of us at Intuitive Machines. Thanks to NASA for the continued support to enable today's successful landing. And of course, everyone at Intuitive Machines, their friends and family who made all of this possible. That will wrap up our coverage of Intuitive Machines' I Am One mission. Thanks for joining us. Woo! All right, back. And I'll need to figure out a good screen to keep it on. Now that we're going to continue talking.
give me a second while I um, create something new. So. Since we're talking about it, where it's just a new. Um, Yep, I'm back. I'm creating something new that we can just. No, use. Green real quick. There we go. Um, so that I, I, I didn't think of a, because I've never done a just talking stream really, because it's usually games, but I talk during the game, like I pause it and start talking. Um. So the, actually having a good background while I talk. Um. Yum 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 yum. Absolutely different concept right now. Uh -huh. I I'm I'm jumping on this one. It, it, it working real quick. Like <laughs> nothing like showing how good a streamer I am. Ten out of ten. Need need help. Huh. See all. Down. I'm the best at what I do. Absolutely the best. Oh my god. So now I'm looking at that coloration. That coloration kind of doesn't work because I have red hair. Uh -huh. Like I said, I am good at what I do. Ten out of ten. Please, please, please. You went to art school. Why are you doing this to yourself? Yeah, it's just the red... Well, kind of... The color of my red hair kind of... Oh, it's high Fox! <laughs> Messes with that. Um... On a better one. Pretty good. I've been here nerding out because I'm a nerd and it's nothing new kind of thing, but uh better. That's a better better coloration. Like I said, she doesn't go to art school or anything. She's a bit of a I am absolutely enjoying myself. I am nerding out like you wouldn't believe. Now that I'm looking at the chat screen. Very interesting color. Like I said, I know what I'm doing! <laughs> I'm a good streamer who hasn't been doing this for how long?
I have all the judgment on myself, so I'm just gonna... Other places. All right. Articles. Hopefully this works. <laughs> Nerd am I, me or nerdy, nerdy. Let's go. All right. <clears throat> Apparently, um, there's been new information on uh, Saturn's moon Titan. Um, it was once suggested to possibly contain hidden life inside its huge subsurface ocean, but these hopes may have been um, scrapped by a new discovery. Titan is likely in uninhabitable from its surface to its enormous subsurface ocean, a new paper in Astrobiology reveals. This comes as scientists found that there simply aren't enough amino acids in Titan's ocean to sustain life. In this study, we quantified the amount of organic molecules that could be transferred from Titan's rich or organic rich surface to its subsurface ocean through impact cratering, we found that the amount of organics that is transferred this way is quite small. No more than 750, I mean, seven, not 750, 7,500, I don't know where I got seven, um, kilograms a year of glycine in the most optimistic scenario. This is not sufficient to sustain life on Titan's subsurface ocean. Of course, Titan is the largest moon of Saturn and the second largest moon in the entire solar system after Jupiter's Ganymede. That's about 50% larger than the Earth's moon with an atmosphere mostly made of nitrogen and small amounts of methane and hydrogen. This is going to be really nerdy from me. Um... Uh, and I admit this now. Have y'all ever played the game? Let's see. I don't remember the exact game, but it's something, um, simulation. Space one. My mind's dying. Like, the really cool space one. And it's like really, really in depth. Like, but I haven't done much with it mainly because uh, I'm not very good with it. But you could like simulate a whole bunch of stuff with the universes and stuff. And I was nerdy enough when I first kind of heard about this was to try and I don't know, simulate something like this existing. When I, well, not when I first heard about it, but when I first got the game for that. Uh, universe Sandbox like Oh, uh, well, Universe Sandbox. Yeah, Universe Sandbox! <laughs> Oh, it's no longer available in Steam store. <sighs> I'm old. Um, but it, it's really, really done well, and um, but I tried to do this uh, to figure out this planet or whatever existing. Have you ever heard of uh, Planet Nine? Um, also called Planet X. Um, it's a hypothetical planet, um, that potentially orbits the, uh, outer reaches of the solar system, but it's so far out, um, that the orbit doesn't come un close enough for us to be able to see it to some degree. Um, 
and like well beyond Pluto, well beyond Pluto. Um, but there was a study recently uh, submitted to the Astronomical Journal, um, and it was the goal of it was to narrow down possible locations of Planet Nine and holds the potential to help researchers better understand the makeup of our solar system, along with its formation and evolutionary process. So what was the motivation beyond the, behind this study regarding narrowing down the location of po um, potential Planet Nine? Um, uh, Dr. Mike Brown, who is a Richard and Barbara Rosenberg professor of astronomy at Caltech and lead author of the study, we're continuing to try and systematically cover all the regions of the sky, whereas we predict Planet 9 to be, using data from pan so stars, allowing us allowed us to cover the largest region to date. Um, the reason why it's kind of a curiosity thing is um, I, I found another article that we're, we're probably going to get into right after this. The uh, Just certain alignments that change um, within the solar system, that's the reason why uh, it's hypothetical, um, that the planet nine was big enough to actually pull and create. And that's the reason why they think that there's a planet nine that's not, or planet X, but there's no proof of it because we don't see it. And just the amount of t time it takes to orbit the sun on what the prediction or conjecture is. Um, But, um, anyways, um, PANSARS, which stands for Panoramic Survey Telescope and Rapid Response System, is a collaborative astro astronomical observation system located at the Hel Helica Hala uh, Hala. You'd think I'd know how to say it. Observation and operated by the University of Hawaii Institute of Astronomy, with telescope construction being funded by the U.S. Space Force. For the studies, researchers use the data from Data Release 2, DR2, with the goal of narrowing down the possible locations of Planet 9 based on findings from past studies. In the end, the team narrowed down possible locations of Planet Nine by eliminating approximately 78% of possible locations um, that were calculated from previous studies. Additionally, the researchers also proved new estimates for uh, approximate semi-major access, uh, axes, excuse me, measured by astronomical units and Earth mass size of Planet nine at 500 and 6.6 6 respectively so what are the most significant results from the study and what are the follow-up studies currently being conducted or planned what i would love to say is the most significant result cat don't knock that over most significant result was finding planet nine but we didn't so instead it means we have significantly narrowed the search area We've now surveyed approximately 90% of the regions where we think Planet Nine might be. In terms of follow-up studies, um, Dr. Brown tells um, Universe Today, I think that the LSST is most likely surveyed to find Planet Nine. When it comes a year uh, online in a year or two, it will quickly cover much of the search area, and if Planet Nine is there, we'll find it. LSST stands for Legacy Survey of Space and Time and is an astro astronomical, you think how many times I said that tonight, I can say it correctly, uh, um, survey currently scheduled as a 10 year program to study the Southern sky and take place at Ver Vera C. Rubin Observation, uh, I mean, obs Observatory in Chile, which is presently under construction. Objectives for the LSST including studying, include studying, identifying near-Earth uh, near asteroids and small planetary bodies within our solar system, but also includes deep space studies as well. This includes investigation of the properties of dark matter and dark energy and the evolution of the Milky Way galaxy. 
So what is the importance of finding Planet Nine? Well, I guess this um, article will actually go into it. I might halfway be correct with what I was saying. I I'm hoping I wasn't talking about my ass earlier, but that's what I was remembering of when they were talking about Planet Nine. Um, Dr. Brown tells Universe Today it would be the fifth largest planet in our solar system and the only one, one with the mass between Earth and Uranus. Such planets are common around other stars and we would suddenly have a chance to study one in our own solar system. Scientists began hypothesizing the existence of Planet Nine shortly after discovering Neptune in 1846, including uh, an 100... 1880 memoir authored by D. Kirkwood and later a 1946 uh, paper authored by American astronomer Clyde Tomber, uh, Tombo, or the <laughs> Yagaro, uh, no, Tombo, excuse me, ugh, which was who was responsible for discovering Pluto in 1930s. Oh, well, 1930, excuse me, not 30s. <laughs> More recent studies include studies from 2016 and 2017 presenting evidence for the existence of Planet Nine, a former of which was co-authored by Dr. Brown. This most recent study marks the most complete investigation of narrowing down the location of Planet Nine, which Dr. Brown has long believed exists. There are too many separate signs that Planet Nine is there. The solar system is very difficult to understand without Planet Nine. He continues by telling Universe Today that Planet Nine explains many things about orbits of objects in the outer solar system that would be otherwise unexplainable and would each need some sort of separate explanation. The cluster of the direction of the orbits is best known, but there is also a large perhelion distance of many objects, existence of highly inclined and even retrograde objects, and the highly, uh, excuse me, and the high abundance of very eccentric orbits which cross inside the orbit of Neptune. None of these should happen in the solar system, but all are easily explained as an effect of Planet Nine. Wrong. <laughs> Say, I watch too many of these sci science things to 100% um, remember this stuff sometimes. Okay. <clears throat> Earth's orbit mysteriously altered by chance encounter millions of years ago. A grazing encounter between the solar system and a passing star could have, could once have changed Earth's orbit enough to wreak havoc on the climate, a new research found. Around five, uh, 56 million years ago, at the boundary between the, oh God, trying to say this, Paleocene and Eocene, I guess, period, the Earth's temperature warmed up to 8 degrees Celsius or 14.4 Fahrenheit. This has always been a bit of a puzzle, but planetary scientist Nation Kalo Ka Kaibiv of the Planetary Science Institute and astrophysicist Sean. I, I, have I gotten tired enough where words don't work? Um, John Raymond of the Laboratory of Astrophysics of, uh, it's a French word, it's, uh, the Bordex? Bordeaux? Bordeaux? Is that? Uh, has an X in it. Uh, fr French letters. That. Uh, strange. Suggests a chance encounter might be of cu culprit. Their simulations show a star passing by the solar system could have introduced enough disruption to the planetary orbits to nudge the Earth slightly off course. One reason this is important is because of the geologic record shows that changes in the Earth's orbiter orbital eccentricity accompanied by fluctuations in the Earth's climate. If we want to best search for causes of ancient climate anomalies, it is important to have an idea of what Earth's orbit looked like during these episodes. Piece, uh, piecing together the changes our planet has undergone in its 4.5 billion year lifespan involves some impressive detective work. 
It often takes a combination of geology, modeling, and statistical analysis to reveal the finer details. Based on geological record, we know that the Earth warmed by more than 5 to 8 um, Celsius during the period known as the um, Paleocene Ecocene Thermal Maximum. We also understand that dramatic changes in the Earth's cl climate can correlate to changes in the way the Earth orbits the Sun. But while most modeling in the orbital evolution of the solar system is, uh, over time is tricky, it has already, already been proposed that Earth's orbital eccentricity was notably high during this event. But our results show that the passing stars make detailed predictions of the Earth's past orbital evolution, at this time highly uncertain, and a broader spectrum of orbital behavior is possible uh, is possible is possible than previous thought. Uh, sorry, <laughs> that English sentence. Say as much as I can't speak English, I, I, I my mom was really serious on grammar, so sometimes I sit here and go grammar. And is a broader spectrum of orbital behavior is possible, and a broader spectrum of orbital behavior is possible than previously thought okay me just reading it wrong generally scientists try and reconstruct the evolution of the earth's orbit by attempting to rewind the solar system in simulations but the researchers say these simulations only include the star solar system in isolation and don't take into account the larger populous and dynamic galaxy within its res within it resides although there are a lot of empty space in in space <laughs> dead space, hardy har. Everything in the galaxy is moving and not on the same orbit, trajectory, or speed. Other stars may zoom past the sun as they go about their own star business. And, and if this were to happen, the gravitational interaction with the solar system could have effect on the planets. The solar system is relatively stable, but orbits can be tweaked and fairly easily. The Earth's orbit, for instance, is regularly tugged about by the giant planets, which enact long, periods cha long period changes on its orbital eccentricity, tidal uh, axle tilt, and pre precession. These changes take place over tens of thousands of years, called the oh, Milankovic. I am sorry. I repeat. I'm, our, I'm bad at English, but then trying to read other languages. Milan Koldovic? Koldovic, I think. I'm saying your um, cycles. We have a pretty good handle on them. Um, the researchers wanted to know if a passing star could have a similar effect even from a significant distance. Their work focused on a singular, uh, single known event some 2.8 million years ago, a sun-like star called HD 7977 passed the solar system potentially clo so close that it flew outside the Oort cloud, um, which is far out from the Kipper. It's far, far out, it's not close. Um, it may have flown past at a distance of some 31,000 astronomical units. That's 31,000 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun, and too far to have much effect. But it may have zoomed in as close as 4,000 astronomical units. Upon conducting their simulations, the researchers consistently found the distances closer to the smaller end of the range and had some gra some sort of gravitational influence on the movements of the planets in relation to the sun. HD 7977 is one star and the only flyby we can confidently identify. But scientists have estimated that a star passes by within um, 50,000 astronomical units every million years or so and within 10 thousand astronomical years that astronomical units every 20 million years or so 
This means that it's entirely possible that a passing star has affected Earth's climate in the past and may even have played a role in the thermal maximum. Future studies on long-term evolution of the solar systems really ought to take uh, these passerbys into account, the um, researcher said. Um, we show that stellar encounters play an important role in our solar system's long-term dyna long dynamical evolution, although it takes tens of millions of years for the effects of stellar passages to significantly manifest themselves, the long-term orbital evolution of the Earth and the rest of the planets is linked to these stars. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to actually pull these up on the so you can see some of these images that they found so that you can we we can work along with them so that you understand what we're looking at I, I, that actually might be more dynamic and interesting than what I'm doing on a blank background. And also, like I said, so you can see what you're looking at. That works? Cool. <clears throat> Sun erupts with, the wi uh, with wildly powerful solar flares, the biggest seen in years. Actually, no. Tap it out like that. Actually, no, let me not do that. I just thought of something that I have to that I have saved and I proceed to do it again. Within 24 hours, several X-class flares have inter uh, erupted from its surface, the most powerful of which was a uh, jaw-dropping X6.3. That's the most powerful sun flare seen for the current solar cycle and the most powerful since the X8... Point two erupted in 2017. Although there is no danger to life or infrastructure on Earth, interruptions to high-frequency radio communications and even blackouts may have ensued on the sunlit side of Earth. And the sunspot region responsible, AR3590, is rotating towards the center of the sun's disk, which means it may emit more Earth-direct uh, eruptions as it continues to evolve. The three flares were respectively a X18, I mean X1.8 flare that peaked at 607 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on February 21st, an X1.7 flare that peaked on at 1 uh, tw uh, 32 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on February February 22nd, and the uh, X 6.3 flare that peaked at um, 5.34 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, also on February 22nd. That's about the time that they were trying to do the lander. Think about that for one second. So th this might have been a kind of problem they were having. Goodness. And that was the largest one. Um, and they did have blackouts, didn't they? The ultraviolet flux produced by these events, and they were using radar and lasers. The ultraviolet flux produced by these events is responsible for any radio blackouts. Any more, uh, any of the more worrisome effects on the Earth is usually produced by a coronial mass ejection. Um or CME. These often accompany flares, ejecting billions of tons of coronal plasma with magnetic fields embedded with them, within, excuse me. Neither of these two first two flares were accompanied by a CME at the time of writing, and there's no word on whether the third was similarly bereft. S-class flares are the most powerful flares on the scale. Flares. Ugh. At their worst, they can trigger wild-scale communication blackouts and cause damage to satellites but both the NO 
FAA and the UK Met Office reported that the most recent flare activity posed no threat to the Earth. This sort of behavior isn't unexpected for the sun. Our star our goes through periodic cycles of activity every 11 years or so. Its magnetic field reverses polarity. That is, its north and south magnetic poles switch places. You know, there's talk about the Earth uh, being late for one of those. Because um, it does it at certain periods of Earth's history. Uh, leading up to the switch, the sun gets more and more active. There are more sunspots, more flares, and more CMEs. The polar polarity reversal happens as activity reaches a peak known as a solar maximum before the sun starts to quiet down again. Scientists think we are very close to solar maximum right now, although we'd, we only know months after it has taken place because the scientists calculate it based on declined solar activity. Each solar cycle is different, and predicting how they go is not easy. We are currently in the 25th solar cycle since the counting began. Solar cycle 24 was pretty quiet, a subdued one. And scientists thought 25 would probably go the same way. However, it has been far stronger than official forecasts initially predicted. Um... That doesn't mean we, anything bad for us, but it could mean that we need to rethink our understanding of how the sun works. Uh, meanwhile, we likely have not heard the last of AR-3590. That's the region that's um, uh, of the sun that they're talking about um, that's most face the Earth. Well, um, The sunspot region is very magnetically complex with features that are consistent with high likelihood of reconnection of magnetic field lines. This is the process that unleashed, unleashes the turret of energy in plasma, known as a slower solar flare. AR3590 has a rare magnetic classification given to sunspot regions, most likely to spit out powerful solar flares, so we may not have seen the last of its shenanigans. And we may even get a mild CME, sending just enough uh, solar particles to rain down on the Earth's uh, ion, ion, no, sphere and generate strong, beautiful auroras. I wish I could see those. Um, all right. <clears throat> Goodness. Okay. In 1987, uh, we saw a star explode. The James, um, James Webb, the, the uh, Webb uh, telescope finally uh, found evidence of its remains. In 1987, Earth's sky was lit up by a rare spectacle. The explosion of light from a dying star going supernova and the large Magell Magellanic... Angelic. Angelic is the first guy to circle the Earth. It's named after him by the sound of it. I think it was Angelic. Angelic. I guess I'm saying it right. First became visible in February. Just 1,000. I mean, 100,000. Words. One. 160,000 miles. <sighs> Words! My mind's reading. I'm just going to read the numbers aloud. My mind is having a moment on how to read that aloud. Blah, blah, blah. 168000 light years away. 168,000 miles away. I think that's correct. The event was so bright that it could be seen from the surface of our planet with the naked eye. A pinprick of light that brightened, then faded over the ensuing months. Since then, the material ejected during the supernova, now named SN 1987A, has continued to evolve. No longer visible except through telescopes. 
but its proximity has given scientists an unprecedented view into the immediate aftermath and the evolution of a massive stellar, stellar death. There is, ha There has, however, been an absolutely glaring question. What happened to the remnant core of the star and the piece of it that should remain intact in the messy debris of an, its exploded viscera? Well, we n might now have an answer. Um, the scientists have spotted, uh, spotted unexpected evidence of a neutron star lurking among the stellar uh, debris. Or, yeah. De uh, detritus. I don't remember how to say that word. No, I'm not remember the others. Ah. Um, thanks to the superb spatial resolution and excellent instruments, we have, for the first time, been able to probe the center of a supernova that was create uh, and what was created there. We now know that there is a compact source of ionized radiation, most likely by a neutron star. Neutron star. We have been looking for this from ti the time of explosion, but had to wait till the um, telescope to be able to verify predictions. The core collapse of supernova, uh, the core collapse supernova of a massive star, is one of the most violent events in the universe. These supernova Nuvae occur when a hefty star, more than about eight times the mass of the sun, runs out of material for, for core fusion. Once the fusion has sputtered to, an, to enough of a halt that the outward pressure it produces is no longer sufficient against the inward pressure of gravity, the star goes kablooey. The outer material is blasted out into space, but the core of the star is squashed inward by gravity to an ultra-dense object. Into an ultra-dense object. What this object is depends on the initial mass of the star. Calculations suggest that an initial star between around 8 and 30 solar masses will produce a neutron star. Any heavier and you end up with a black hole. Because we don't get such a front row seats to many supernovae, or nova, novae, Latin. Scientists were super enthusiastic to watch it unfold, but because of all the debris, it was unclear whether S9 1987A resulted in a neutron star or a black hole. Scientists thought that a neutron star was most likely, but have been unable to peer into the dust left behind with high enough resolution to confirm. Uh, the telescope took observations of the... I'll just... WS... The, the ST. <laughs> observations of the famous uh, supernova remnant in 2022. And uh, the scientists turned to these to seek answers. They used the powerful telescope's infrared capabilities to peer into the debris using spectro... Spectro... Op, yeah, opi, the, copy. Spectroscopy to analyze the composition of the gas therein. Around the center of the supernova remnant, close to where the explosion had occurred, they found something surprising. Atoms of heavy argon and sulfur whose outer electrons had been stripped. A process known as ionization. There are multiple avenues for ionization, which entails adding or removing electrons. The team conclude... Uh, the... the team conducted modeling and found that, in this particular context, there was only one explanation, a neutron star. The team's models returned two neutron star scenarios. In the first, powerful ultraviolet and X radiation from a very hot neutron star stripped its electrons as the scar, scar, star cooled. In the second, winds of particles em emanating from a rapid rotating neutron star could have interacted with the surrounding materials to ionize the atoms. See, th this is one of the other reasons why I decided to, you know, pull this up so you could see it. The uh, injected stellar debris, compact items, rings, stellar gas. Our detection with uh, James Webb MIRI and the near spec spectrometers of strong ionized argon and sulfur emission lines from the very center of the nebula that surrounds the supernova 
is a direct evidence of the presence of a central source of ionized radiation. Our data can only be fit fitted with a neutron star as po the power source of that ionized radiation ionizing radiation. The mystery over whether a neutron star is hiding in the dust has lasted for more than 30 years, and exciting we have solved it. By the way, the next supernova that they're thinking may be occurring is Betelgeuse, in the, which is, I think, in the Orion's Belt. Um, this discovery is consistent with several theories about neutron stars. Models suggesting that argon and sulfur, sulfur are produced in large quantities inside a dying star just before it goes supernova. And scientists had decades ago predicted that ultraviolet and X radiation in a supernova remnant represent the presence of a newborn neutron star. But nobody, uh, no one guessed that this might be the way we find it. Um, the supernova keeps offering us surprises. Nobody had predicted that the compact item would be detected through a super strong emission line from argon so it's kind of amusing how we found it the rings of oh. i'm only picking out sun stories about space right now because that's that's the topic i've mentioned something I will say that I'm going to throw something out there for that comment right there. Um, the space could pose an unexpected threat to our gut microbiome. Scientists discovered. I don't know why they're publishing this now. Back when I worked at the Space and Rocket Center, there was talk about this um, from science uh, people. Um, when I do tours of there, there's a mock up of a few of the tunnel uh, areas of the. International Space Station, but one of the things that they've been researching on the space station is um, because the gravitational effects of being not on the Earth, um, cells have actually, the test cells that they have have expanded enough so that you can see inside the nuclei that they haven't before been able to see because, of course, there's no gravity. Um, so we've seen inside the human cell far better than we ever have with any, um, I want to say telescopes, but yeah, it is telescopes, um, which has led to people, uh, the different talks about different medications that can help. So the idea that gut, <laughs> gut microbio is having problems it's no surprise whatsoever. Um, besides the fact that it's in a highly sterilized environment. Um, so. Throwing that out there. <clears throat> uh, okay. The James Webb Telescope, if you're wondering, or Space Telescope, if, if you're wondering what that is. Um, Caught a hidden galaxy like our own growing at the dawn of time. Gigantic galaxies we see in the universe today, including our own Milky Way galaxy, started out far smaller. Merging, murders throughout the universe's 13.7 billion years gradually assembled today's massive galaxies, but they may have begun as mere star clusters in an effort to understand the earliest galaxies. JWS has examined their ancient lights for clues as to how they became so massive. Um, the teleco the te 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 <laughs> telescope can effectively see back in time to when the universe was only about 5% as old as it is now. In that distant past, structures that would eventually become the mass as massive as the Milky Way and even larger were only about one one ten thousandth as massive as they are today, I mean, as they are now. What clues can the powerful infrared teles space telescope under uncover us show us how the galaxies grew so large? A new paper presents the observations of a galaxy at redshift Z 
um, 8.3, oh, I guess estimated. Um, at that redshift, the light has been traveling for over 13 billion years and began its journey only 600 million years after the Big Bang. There's that picture. The galaxy is called the Firefly Sparkle. Yeah, Sparkle. My, 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 this will probably be one of the last ones because uh, I'm not doing reading well. Um, contains a network... Network. I'm even saying things wrong. Network of massive star clusters that are evidence of how galaxies grow. Um, despite the telescope's power, this distant and ancient galaxy is only visible through the gravitational lenses of a massive cluster of foreground galaxies. The lenses makes Firefly Sparkle appear as an arc. The two other galaxies also in the vicinity are called <laughs> Firefly Best Friend, BF, and Firefly New Best Friend. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Fun naming this. Okay, this is, these are pictures of it. <laughs> well, it's good that they've stopped with the, you know, overly scientific things. Um, the Firefly Sparkle I I exhibits the hallmarks of expected of a future Milky Way type galaxy captured during its earliest and most gas rich stage of formation the young galaxy's mass is concentrated in 10 clusters which range from about 200,000 solar masses to 600 63 630 000 solar masses I'm sorry uh, yeah I've I think I've reached the point. I think one more after this. There was one more that I was really interested in. According to the authors, these clusters straddle the boundary between low-mass galaxies and high-mass global clusters. These clusters are significant because they're clues on how the galaxy is growing. The researchers were able to gauge the ages of the clusters and their star formation histories. They found that they experienced a burst of star formation around the same time. These clusters... The cluster ages suggest that they are gravitationally bound with star formation histories shown in a recent starburst, possibly triggered by the interaction with a companion galaxy at the same redshift at the project distance. Okay, it's projected distance. That's what the d -d 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 line is estimated. Uh, to KP away from Firefly Sparkle. There are two candidates from the interacting galaxy. Um, Firefly best friend and Firefly new best friend. <laughs> they, see, apparently they broke up. So there's just, you know, I had a best friend, but now I have a new best friend. Sorry. Um, but the NBF is about 13 KPCs away. Well, um, BF is about 2 KPCs away, making uh, BF the likely interactor. <laughs> Faint low surface brightness features are visible at the corners of the arc close to the neighborhood. N neighborhood. Neighbor! <coughs> Hinting at possible interaction between the two galaxies, which may have triggered a burst star formation in both of them. The researchers paid special attention to the central cluster. They found that temperature is, ex is extremely high at about 40,000 Kelvin, which is. Uh, 40,000 Celsius or 72,000 Celsius uh, Fahrenheit, excuse me, and also has a top heavy initial mass function, a signal that it formed in a very metal poor environment. These observations and other evidence show that the Firefly Sparkle is very likely a progenitor of galaxies like our own. For these, re this, these reasons, the Firefly Sparkle provides an unprecedented case study of a Milky Way-like galaxy in the earliest stages of its assembly in only a 600 million year old universe. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, like I said, I've hit the... <laughs> Fortunately, the researchers behind these results have a powerful supercomputer simulation to compare observations with. It's called the Illustrious TNG. It's a massive cosmological magnohydrodynamical simulation based on a comprehensive physical model of the universe. The uh, 
I guess the computer made three runs called TNG50, TNG100, and TNG300. The researchers compared their results with TNG50. Finding these ancient star clusters is intriguing, but we can't assume they'll survive intact. There are tidal and evaporative forces at work. The authors examined the stability of individual star clusters and how they'll fare over time. Most of these star clusters are expected to survive to present-day universe and will expand and then get ripped apart to form the stellar disk and the halo of the galaxy. The only way they survive is to get kicked out of lar out to large distances away from the d dense tidal field of the galaxy. The ones that get kicked out may persist as global global R the global R clusters. Um, one of the telescope's primary science goals is to study how galaxies form and evolve in the early universe. By finding one in which clusters are still forming, this, this telescope reached its goal. The Firefly Sparkle represents one of uh, the space uh, telescope's first spectro spectro photo photometric observations of an extremely lens galaxy assembled at high red shifts with the clusters that are in the process of formation instead of seeing it later uh, epochs later good where was the other one that, that, that one I'm saving for later This. <clears throat> Just because the name of it, I have to. Strange object described as Dracula's sandwich. Dracula's sandwich, come on. Could represent a new kind of baby star. Space, it seems, is teeming not with stars and galaxies, but also with delicious cosmic snacks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, writer, for that joke. The, a new object in the Milky Way discovered by a team of astronomers led by I the uh, the friend Ver Gia of the US Naval is Observatory which has been given the name Dracula's Chivito Chivito I that's, that's, I have I recognize it. I can't remember how to say it. After the meat-laden sandwich that is the national di dish of Uruguay. In reality, I'm just going to call it Dracula Star, is a baby star surrounded by a thick disk of dust and gas. Viewed edge on, the arrangement, uh, arrangement looks like a sandwich if you squint. I mean, look at it, I guess, but I, I think it looks more like a hot dog, but that's just me. That's not the only reason for the object's odd name. A similar shaped object spiraled in the Milky Way back in 1985 was called Gomez's Hamburger and later identified as in 2008 as a baby star some 900 light years away. Um, this is Dracula this is similar to Gomez's Hamburger. It's similar distance away some 980 light years or so and it's similarly oriented so that the disk of dust and gas cuts through the light of the star like filling in a sandwich giving us a very different view of the star formation process compared to what we usually see and while the two objects are rare they could represent a class of newborn stars we know very little about because neither of them appear in typical in the typical environment for baby stars known as stellar nurseries which are rich in materials from which new stars are forged rather both stars seem to be floating in a relatively empty space with flu <laughs> few clues as how they came to be born we know a fair bit about stellar birth process based on a growing number of radio observations each star's life is a dense clump uh, in the cloud of molecular gas yeah like i said i i think i've reached the point molecular ga gas when i'm messing up three letter words i think this is the 
the last article that collapses under its own gravity, forming the seed of a baby star. As the protostar spins, it grows, and the material from the cloud around it organizes into a disk that swirls around it, feeding the star's growth. Um, how these two, however, appear not to be associated with any nearby star-forming region or star cr cluster is something of a mystery. Some clues may might lie in the similarity of the two objects. Here's what we know about uh, Dracula's... Chivito? I'm, I'm just sliding, slaughtering this. Um, scientists determined the central star is l likely a hot, hot Herbig AE type star burning around. Let me pull that out. What is a Herbig AE star? Is a okay? Is a pre-main sequence a young? I guess greater than ten myr. What the fuck is ten? I, I'm quite sure I should remember this. Star of spectral types A or B. These stars are still embedded in gas dust uh, envelopes and are sometimes accompanied by a, a circumstellar disks. Hydrogen and calcium emissions lines are observed from their spectra. They are two to eight solar mass objects still existing in the star formation, uh, which is a gravitational con contradiction stage, and approaching the main sequence. Um, in other words, they're not burning hydrogen in their center. I guess it's talking about, yeah, sequence star. Um, Okay, M. I can't believe I forgot this. M Y A is a million years ago, but uh, what it's talking about for that is stages. If you're wondering what the pre-main sequence star is, um, if anyways, um, at temperatures around eight thousand Kelvin, which is seven thousand seven. 127 Celsius or 13,940 Fahrenheit. Now I remember how to say stuff like that. The disk spans some 1,650 astronomical units in radius. That's about 1,650 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun, and contains materials with a mass amount of uh, the mass of around 0 0.2 suns. We're having an ad break, so let me. Take that chance to drink. I'm uh, such a nerd. Well, once again, the original stream for. The lander was an hour and like 47 minutes long, and I have stretched this out to nearly five hours. I'm a nerd, 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 I'm a nerd. Three, two, one, okay. <clears throat> now that the community is back, I, I was. Pausing for y'all. <clears throat> Contains a material with a mass about two points. I mean, zero point two suns. This is fairly close to the properties of Gomez's hamburger, but Dracula, um, Chivito has something extra: two protruding filaments from the buns that are researchers liken to fangs. That's the Dracula's part. After modeling stellar formation, the researchers concluded that these filaments suggest a dissipation, dissipating envelope around the star. This fading bubble of material can help scientists work out exactly how far along the star is in its formation process, since baby stars tend to emit powerful winds and jets that blow away the excess material around them. The presence of the thin envelope suggests that the star is ver still very young. 
Um, the discovery represents a new opportunity to study the vertical structure of star formation process, but also suggests that while possibly rare, I, while possibly rare isolated baby stars may be more common than we thought. There remain, however, many questions of how they came to be when, where they are all alone in the darkness of space. But yeah, that, that's the picture of it. Dracula, that looks more like the um, like original Dracula, you know, black and white Dracula. Anyways. All right, like I said, my voice is going. <laughs> uh. All right, let me find somebody to raid. Unless um, a wild fox appears. I'm gonna annoy Pando, just because I can annoy Pando. All right, y'all. This was Ish Like Here Fox. I hope you have a good day or night, whenever it is, wherever it is you currently are. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like, subscribe, and comment. Uh, and I'll be back tomorrow. But maybe Genshin, because um, they had that new event that came up, or maybe. Um, Uh, continuing with Metal Gear Rising for Vengeance, so we'll see. Like I said, I don't do these just talks very much, but I do do scientific readings of stuff while in stream a lot of times if I'm, you know, ADHD bothered, so. But if enough people like these, I might set up just specific space-related ones every once in a while, so. Anyways. Alright, y'all. Let's go annoy Pando.